Commissioner, we're ready. Well, good evening. Uh, before I call the meeting to order, I do want to announce that some committee members, staff, and the public are attending remotely via Zoom, as well as on site. All participants joining by phone should mute their phones when not speaking to avoid background noise. During the meeting, please make sure that you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak, so the public observing knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and it's the current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to the meeting, and those comments will be included in the record of this meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting the clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before the meeting. The public also will have an opportunity to provide brief comments either by telephone or via Zoom from the fifth floor conference room of the municipal office building. Uh, I will now call the meeting of the Economic Development Finance Standing Committee to order. And I would ask the clerk to please call the roll. Roll call. Haley? Present. Davis? Here. Townsend? Here. Stites? Here. McKiernan? Here. Burroughs? Here. Thank you, committee. Uh, our first order of, of business, uh, there was no revisions to tonight's agenda. So our first order of business will be the uh, uh, approval of standing minutes from January 3rd and February 7th, 2022. So I'd entertain a motion or comments. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Townsend, District 1 moved to approve the submitted. We do have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We do have a motion and a second. I would ask the clerk to please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Commissioner Davis, you're muted. Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Thank you, committee. That takes us to our first item this evening, which was for information only. And it's a presentation for the motor vehicle county facility fee. Uh, this is a presentation regarding the $5 county facility fee charged by the treasury for in-person renewal of vehicle tags. And it is being submitted by Becky Berger, our treasurer, Andrea Vineyard, deputy treasurer, and Rocky Mays, management analyst, clerical and administrative assessment manager. Ladies, welcome. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Rocky Mays. Um, I've been put on assignment from the county administrator's office, and I have the experts with me tonight. I have Andrea Vineyard to the right of me, the deputy treasurer, and I have Debbie Joshua to the left of me, the deputy CFO. Um, this $5 county facility fee was brought up in the May 12th full commission meeting by Commissioner Bynum, asking if we still uh, charge this fee and the administrator asked me to do some research on it to find out where this fee came from and why we're charging it. And we're just showing it to you all tonight for information only. Um, so where it began is this originally was charged for anybody doing business out at the annex only. This was a $3 fee and it was more of a convenience fee because the annex is more convenient to get into than the courthouse. Um, in 2014, it was brought to as part of the uh, 2014 amended and 2015 proposed budget. It was approved by you all um, to have this be a $5 county facility fee, which means that uh, Wyandotte County charged $5 for anybody who came in and did renewals only, not new title work or anything like that. It was renewals only. Uh, the purpose of this was to improve customer service. Uh, renewals usually are about a five to 10 minute transaction. So this was trying to get everybody to get online, um, do it by mail, do it something easier than to come in and wait maybe four hours in line for something that would take five to 10 minutes. Uh, this facility fee is charged in 22 counties in Kansas. And out of those 22 counties, three of those counties charge a fee at their annex locations only. And according to state statute, um, basically the treasurer is allowed to put this fee on, this $5 fee on any transaction that is inside their facility. 
Um, here's the good stuff here is this is the financials. So you'll see in this first bucket here that the annex fee, that, like I said, was $3. It was only charged at the 8,200 state location. This is from 2011 to 2014. Like I said, this was only the annex fee. This was not charged downtown. <clears throat> and then you'll see the next here, and that's when it got approved in the budget. So it started in 2015. And this is the revenue that was being brought in by that $5 fee. You'll see in 2020, when the pandemic hit, it took a huge dip because the facility closed for about two years now. Did you guys need on this slide a little bit longer? Or you wanna go ahead? Okay. All right, and right now, um, our renewal options in the Treasury Department is to Download the MyWICO app. You can get online, renew your tags online. You can stick a stamp on an envelope, send it in by mail, and they'll mail those tags right to your house. It does not take very long. Um, the courthouse and the annex both have drop boxes. So if you want to do a renewal, all you have to do is drop it in one of those nice little drop boxes. And as of last Thursday, they started doing in-person renewals. Starting on July 5th, all transactions will be available by appointment. So people can make appointments for renewals, new transactions, et cetera. And uh, that's basically the gist of it. We were just brought it, the, this fee can be uh, eliminated by the county administrator if she chooses to do so. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rocky. Thank you. Any questions? Committee, any comments? Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Townsend, District 1. Thank you, Ms. Mays. I have one question because I was here when this was implemented. And as you mentioned earlier, it was um, imposed to decrease the number of citizens who actually came in and to promote efficiency and, and get people to do this through the mail or electronically. Do we have any? numbers that support what happened in terms of fewer people actually coming in compared to taking advantage of some of the other options, the mail, electronic um, options to pay these fees. Andrew Vineyard, Deputy Treasurer, I can actually answer that for you. Um, yes, since 2014, when we switched to the new system, we um, tracked every statistic that came in in terms of um, transactions. First year, full year from 2015 to 2016, there's an 8% drop in walk-in, another 4% the next year, and it slowly went down. And then we'd hit about a, you know, a level where we were at about 60% online, which flipped from what would have been the 20% online four years prior to that. And it goes all the way through pandemic through today, where we're at 65% of online renewal process since we switched from the old vendor to what is now the MyYCO app. So we have all that statistical data we can provide at any time. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, thank y'all so much for the presentation. Uh, my uh, main question is what, what is the, the revenue used for? Um, I know that conversation has come up on us not wanting to um, you know, burden our residents with this fee. Um, I'm just curious as to what you all do with the revenue and how it would impact your department if you no longer receive that revenue. Good evening, Commissioner. Um, Debbie Johnshire, Deputy Chief Financial Officer. Um, the revenue that comes in is deposited into the county general fund in the treasurer's division. So it does go to offset expenses for the motor vehicle department. Thank you. Anybody else got their hand up? Okay, thank you. I, I do have one question, if I may. The I'm looking at the budget on the actuals, and the budget in 2015. We've ran over basically 350 thousand over the last eight, ten years. Was that money deposited into the general fund, or does that stay within the treasury uh, budget? It was in the county general fund in the treasury division. Yes. It stays within that budget to buy 
software to uh, ensure that we meet all criteria necessary to properly process the renewals and application process with the state? That's correct. It would offset any operating expenses that could be personnel, supplies. Great, thank you. I have no further questions. Is there any questions from the public? Any hands? We have a Thomas that has his hand up. Okay. Mr. Thomas, uh, you're, you're, you have two minutes, I believe. Three. You have three minutes, please. Name your, please list your name and uh, place of residence and you have three minutes. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, my name is Thomas Gordon. I live in Wyandotte County at 2521 North 7th Street in Kansas City, Kansas, 66101. My question is that the revenue that's collected for the renewal of the vehicles in Wyandotte County, isn't that money used to for the general maintenance of the motor vehicle department normally? Does anybody want to respond to Mr. Thomas's question? Yes, as I said, their revenue, Debbie, Debbie Johncher, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, um, the revenue that's collected does go back to fund operations within the motor vehicle department. Okay, and, and the $5 fee that was imposed upon the uh, citizens for renewal was to eliminate the over burden of people coming in and standing in line for four hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, if we do not have that fee, then wouldn't that require the motor vehicle department to maybe raise the cost of renewing the vehicles? The, I don't know that we, we would we would raise the the facility fee. Most of the via, the fees that are collected uh, for motor vehicle are fees that go back to the state. Okay, so the county doesn't benefit from any monies that's collected to renew their vehicles. That's correct. But the okay. fee the fee does come back to the county. The facility fee um, does come back to the county. Okay. What I, and the focus of my question is, does it really make a difference whether we keep, if we eliminate it, that really would not impact the operations of the motor vehicle department. And for the people that do not have the uh, ability to renew online or some of the senior citizens that don't know how to operate the um, internet to be able to renew it, you know, that's an unfair burden on the seniors because we already have a limited fixed amount of income and we don't really get that much of a cost of a increase. Even though it's just $5, it's just a frustration. And the- One minute remaining. It's just a frustration that's been imposed upon the seniors because now that person, not only do they have to try to get there, they have to pay a fee on top of that as well. So I'd like to see it weighed for seniors that are on social security or fixed income. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, staff. Any other hands or anybody in the lobby, any other community comments? There are no hands raised and the clerk's office did not receive any comments. Thank you, committee. This was for information only staff. Thank you so very much for your, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Townsend District 1. I uh, just wanted to uh, say again that online payment is not the only option. The original option or one of the two original options was to pay by mail. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that is still a viable option. So you've got the cost of an envelope and a stamp, but that is still an option for any and everyone who wants to use it. Um, I would like to ask though, have we seen more of a rise to pre-pandemic levels yet? Or is it too early to tell in the number of people coming in to uh, transact the renewal business? Andrew Vineyard, Deputy Treasurer. I would say it's, it's too early, but it's different because we implemented a, a temporary operation through UMB's lockbox service that would have taken mm -hmm. on that mail burden. 
mm-hmm. taking that piece out, bringing people back in last week. Um, we see an overflow, but it's still highly going to be online. And we want we continue to use that feature and propose that option because it's the easiest, quickest way for them to get their renewal done. Mm-hmm. Um, but give us a month and I could tell you it may be a different conversation. Okay. And one last question, which would be a, a comparison before the institution of this $5 fee. Do we have any idea what the percentages were for people who were paying online, if that was even an option then? or paying by mail. Sure. Uh, again, Andrew Vineyard, Deputy Treasurer, we we only started tracking statistics from my predecessor who came in in 2014. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately that, that data is not available to us now. Um, but I can say in office, we were at 80%. And the online option has been there since about 2012 when we deployed the new solution from the state of Kansas. Mm-hmm. And the web tag version was barely used at all. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Townsend, could you pull your microphone a little closer when you speak, please? Thank you. I've got this noise behind me here. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, as I stated, this item was for information only. And uh, ladies, thank you for the presentation. We'll move on to item number two, which is uh, another presentation for information only, and that's budget revisions in excess of 50,000 for radio replacement for the WICO area fire services. And this is, um, as I stated, for procurement of a uh, new radio for the fire department. And uh, I'll wait for them to get seated. And I'll call upon Michael Peterson, Assistant Budget Manager. You'll be making the presentation this evening. Uh, That's correct. Thank you. It's all yours. Okay, I'm Michael Peterson, Assistant Budget Manager. I've been working with Matt May and emergency management on the radio replacement project that we have undergoing in, in Wyandotte County. And so um, basically the proposal for this budget revision, um, and this is an emergency revision, is we originally had it slated as um, a $15 million project that was going to start in 2023, going for five years, um, because of the fact that um, we found that intrinsic, the, the fire radios are require a different standard to operate, and Motorola is no longer supporting the repair of the, those radios. I think Matt May was here to present during the second CMIP meeting, and he discussed it. Um, but we're proposing, or we're, we're working through the process of getting access to $1.7 million prior to the amended budget in order to um, replace those radios since we can no longer get them safely repaired by the vendor. Um, a, a grant did come up during that CMIP meeting, and we have found that FIRE is requesting a grant for those radios, KCK Fire Department, but that would not cover Bonner or Edwardsville Fire Radios, and this is a countywide project. Also, um, if we will not know if that grant is received until after we need the funding, so if that grant is received, then it's our understanding that we could use that funding to help um, procure the radios at that point. Any questions or comments? Commissioner Stites? Stites, District 7. So when you say uh, the fund, you wouldn't know if you received the grant prior to you needing the money. What's, what's um, making so, you need the money prior to knowing when if you've received the grant? So it's, I guess there's no extra radios that aren't in service. And so anytime a radio breaks down, they have to send it in for repair. When it comes back from being repaired, it's no longer intrinsically safe, which means I guess that that the definition of that is um, it's preventing the radios from sparking or causing some sort of uh, an incident in a fire situation. And yep. so, so with the, the lag, the lead time and the supply chain issues we're having now and just the anticipated time, to get the radios, we want to place the order as soon as possible and not have to wait until um, the budget is approved in in August or September. And the grant would be awarded when? We would know by September 1st. On the grant? Yes. Okay. And then you said that it would be, it's, why would it not include Bonner Springs in Edwardsville if it's a county grant? So, so the so the grant, uh, the Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department is going out for the grant, and the grant is for the Kansas City, Kansas Fire Department. So when you but if we cover it as a county, it will, if we cover it with county funds, it will cover Bonner Springs and Edwards. Yeah, so the radio project covers the whole county, but the grant that the KCK Fire Department is going for would only cover KCK. Got it. Thank you. 
Any other questions or comments, committee? Oh, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Townsend, District One. Do we know at this point what's the anticipated amount of the grant that is being sought? It is one point seven million dollars, also, and that will cover the entire, the entirety of the overage. Or how so that will cover the fire department's portion. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, so the fire department, if they if they get the grant, they will. They will be, get a different type of radio, so so the cost would be a little bit more. They're getting like one point seven to one point eight million dollars. Mm -hmm. The fire department goes out for the grant, the KCK fire department that is, mm -hmm. uh, and then the amount that we're doing is one point seven million dollars, and that's for the KCK fire department and also the Bonner Springs fire department, Eversville fire department. Okay, would that cover a hundred percent of the cost though? The uh, for KCK at least. I, th I think there is like a, a small match, maybe around one hundred eighty thousand dollars or so. Okay, thank you. Did you say Commissioner Davis? Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, uh, 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 Reggie, Mr. Peterson. Um, just a question about this grant as well. In the event that we do get the grant, will those funds just be returned to the general city fund, or where where will we see the reimbursement? in the event that we got the grant for the radios. <laughs> so if we know that we get the grant by September 1st, we won't even have to use the county general funds. Um, we, we, would just, we would just go with the, the grant funds. But now if we have the order in place, the order is going to take like possibly four to six month months with the supply chain issues to get these radios. So we want to order these radios as soon as possible because we deem it as an emergency because they are kind of dangerous for the fire department to use because there's a possibility of them inflaming while they're on a, on a call. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. I'll ask the clerk if any comments were received from the public. No comments were received and no hands are available. Thank you. Uh, I'll now address the members of the public who wish to address a committee. If there are any in the uh, lower level. Bobby. No one. Uh, again, this item was for information only. Committee, thank you. Thank you, Reggie and Mr. Uh, Peterson. Thank you for your presentation. This takes us to item number three, which will be an action item committee. And this is our third item, and it's also a presentation from our budget department on a budget revision for the construction of the new Turner Fire Station. There is a request to fast track this item to the June 9th full commission meeting, and uh, I believe they're ready. So I will recognize Reginald Lindsay, our budget manager. Mr. Lindsay, All right. uh, your show, buddy. Thank you. So I also have John Kelly, the director of facilities, and also Deputy Chief Andrade from the fire department, and then also architect on the uh, new fire station, Cal. I'm sorry, I don't know Cal's last name, but he was kind enough to join us. It's Kyle Morrison with ARC Images. All right. Uh, so basically what our request is, is generally when we do a budget request that's over $50,000 um, and it's an emergency, the county administrator and the mayor can sign off on it. But in this particular case, this is not an emergency and we have to bring it to the commission uh, for it to be approved. And what we would like to do is... Um, present the information to you all in hopes that you would approve it and move it to the full commission on Thursday night um, so they can be voted on there. So what we have going on is a uh, uh, new fire station that we're going to be building in Turner. The construction costs have increased by $2.1 million. We plan to use one and a half million dollars uh, of fire department money that they have for a quartermaster project. Uh, that was approved for this year. And then we were looking to spend another $600,000 next year. And basically, uh, we've pretty much identified all that funding from uh, the fire department's budget. And I'll kind of let uh, John, John, if, if, I don't know if there's any questions or anything about the particular construction or anything, but I'll just kind of let. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, commissioners and administration and other staff, I would just like to make mention, and I'm sure you guys are hearing this across the board of, you know, with inflation and ongoing 
uh, prices and construction are, are impacting this project along with several other projects. And I think it's an unfortunate, but it's going to be something that you guys are going to be hearing as we go through the budget process and going into next year as well. But uh, as uh, Reggie stated, this particular project just from January to uh, May uh, went up almost 1.8, which is right around 22%. And all those things that drive that are the cost from construction materials to the fueling, uh, you know, fuel for the equipment, uh, supply chain issues. Uh, I know a week and a half ago that you guys were presented uh, budget uh, items and the, the topic of Fire Station 12 and Piper got brought up that the time frame seemed to be lengthy in time that uh, Commissioner Kane uh, spoke of and <clears throat> talked about the team. There were some issues with that particular site that caused some, uh, you know, growing pains, I think, for everybody on that project. But uh, Kyle with his uh, architect firm and then with Heron Construction, who was also selected for this particular fire station uh, and Turner uh, have been good partners. And I just think that the reason we're looking for you guys to approve this to move forward to Thursday night is because we just don't think the numbers going to get any better. Even if we were to wait and uh, table this project, we don't think that that number is going to get back to a number that we feel like uh, you guys will be able to, uh, you know, let the project move forward. So uh, our hopes are that we can get this uh, pushed through so we can get this particular uh, station in Turner uh, underway, but being this, there were concern about time delay uh, with the, the fire station that took place um, in uh, the Piper area. I will say that I'm not going to sit here today and tell you guys or anybody that that there might be some delays because there are delays with roofing materials, mechanical equipment, uh, our own board of public utilities is having issues with transformers uh, being here. And I've been working hand in hand with BPU on this particular project, me and Kyle for the last probably what we say Kyle last two to three months on getting uh, people to get the electrical for the site and we still haven't got those numbers so uh, I just want to make you know everybody aware that I, I don't think this is just this project in general I think we're going to see multiple projects that we're working on uh, that will be uh, you know unfortunately giving bad news due to rising cost so um, like I said I don't know if anybody has any particular questions for me or the architect or Jack but uh I just kind of wanted to touch back going to a week and a half goes meeting of the time frame and the, and the, and the partners that we have. I, like I said, I um, feel like we're, we're going down the right path with this particular station, but unfortunately the cost is starting to get away from us. Committee, any questions? All well, hands are up, right? Let's see. Okay. Great. I'll ask the clerk if there are any comments. BPU, David Haley has his hands up. Mr. Haley, welcome to the committee this evening. Uh, you have a question, Mr. Haley. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I didn't get clarity on the request that came to uh, the utility uh, for transformers. I, I was listening. I thought I was copiously listening to uh, what he just said, but could you please clarify what request was made and what has not yet been received by way of that information? So, Mr. Haley, John Kelly, Director of Facilities, uh, BPU has been working with us uh, hand in hand, uh, very good uh, partners in regards to this particular project. What I informed you guys of uh, tonight is that BPU themselves are seeing supply chain issues with uh, transformers and such for projects. This particular project for the Turner Fire Station there is a, a, a transformer for this that I believe has been on held for this project, which is good. That we're what what I'm referring to is just in general other equipment and also cost associated with bringing the power. There's some uh, contractual fees uh, from third parties that BPU uses to and uh, to get the power. There's some power issues that we have to do some design work there on 55th. And I think if Kyle would like to give maybe a kind of a two minute blurb, just so you understand that, Mr. Haley, uh, to what needs to happen there, then you can maybe have an idea and just kind of with what I'm talking about. BPU has been working very well with us up to this point. We're just still waiting on some additional uh, costs to see how that's going to impact the project. I, I would agree with John. The folks from BPU have been extremely helpful. Uh, we were, there was a concern for a little while about getting a transformer, but one has been identified 
the other issue that we've been working on is uh, on the um, high tension power line that runs down 55th and then turns and runs north on Douglas. Uh, we're making some modifications so that the down guys don't come down in the front yard of the fire station and uh, have been working with uh, folks at, at BPU on that. And I think that that issue has been mostly resolved now. Um, but during those discussions, a, a lot of the discussion was just how long is it going to take to get the parts that we need? And, and I think those parts have been found and identified. And, and so that in that particular instance, that has been put to bed. Very good. Thank you. And thank you both. In your hands, right? <laughs> Mr. Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I this 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 is a little tough for me because this is a lot of money that's being requested. And given the concerns of of uh, another commissioner, it does make me fairly hesitant. So if you all can indulge me here, um, are there any non supply chain related issues that have caused delay on this project? Well, Commissioner, so contractually where we're at, uh, we this is why we're requesting the funds to move forward to go into contract with. Uh, we selected a CMR construction manager at risk for the project, which acts as the general contractor. And this is why we're trying to fast track this because the longer we wait, the number is continuing, you know, weekly. Some of these uh, 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 materials, there are some supply chain issues, but I don't feel comfortable telling you today uh, which issues. I mean, maybe Kyle from the industry could talk, but I will tell you ones that I'm talking with other trade partners, we're talking about uh, mechanical equipment and roofing materials. Uh, so, you know, those two things will, you know, be in this particular uh, project. I don't know, Kyle, are there any other? Uh, I don't know if as far as masonry type stuff, if there's any issues with concrete or block or um, any of those materials. I, I really don't mean to give an evasive answer, but it it seems like every month it's something different. Uh, currently, as John said, one of the big things is the uh, membrane roofing that we use. And uh, I'm told that right now, the manufacturer will give you a price for the roofing when they load the truck and as far as a firm price and, and a delivery date. Um, it's, you know, one month, bar, you can't get bar joists. Another month, the next month, it's some uh, mechanical equipment item that you can't get. The next month, it's light fixtures. It just is a moving target. There's no one thing that we've been hit with. Um, everything seems at different times to be difficult to get. So it's um, in, in the uh, um, Station 12 project, one thing that I would point out is that during construction is when the pandemic hit. And so they actually had to reduce the, the workforce on the job site to be able to spread people out to, because we were all learning how this works at that time. And they, they actually had to reduce their workforce somewhat to be able to spread people out to, um, um, you know, with the six foot guidelines and so forth, and which added a little bit of time to the, to the project, along with the weather and site conditions that John referred to. In this case, um, we, it's, it's very, very difficult for anybody to, um, be sure and, and say, well, as you know, we've, uh, we figured out the roofing issue. And so there are no more issues. Um, yeah. And, and commissioner John Kelly, just to speak up. And I, I just talked to so many different, uh, you know, different contractors throughout the week. And it, like Kyle said, it's just, it's kind of a, a moving target. So that's why I just wanted to stress that, you know, even though that we're looking for approval on these uh, budget dollars. And I don't, I think Reggie had made mention, you know, these were some already allocated dollars that you guys approved for the fire department on another project. So uh, we're taking uh, dollars within another project that we're just moving the timeline in order for us to get the, what I'm saying and not to make alarming to anybody or make somebody feel like we don't make this decision, but the health, life and safety of the people there in Turner. And then, like I said, we're replacing two fire stations 
that are uh, in not the best of conditions and uh, putting them into like what we did at Fire Station 12, more of a state of an art facility that will be able to uh, be not only for our firefighters to keep them safe coming back from fires, but as well as the community in itself. So that's the only reason I made mention of that, Commissioner, because I, I don't want to sit here today and act like we're not going to have any issues with time frames because I don't have that crystal ball and I don't think any of our contractors. And in my 28 years of been doing this, I've never had contractors that will tell us that they'll hold pricing for one day or one week. It's that's never been done before. So that just tells you right there, if people are doing that, it's just, it's, it's just not here in Wyandotte County. It's everywhere. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and Turner is, is part of the eighth district. And so um, that's kind of where my, my questions are, are coming from. Well, thank y'all so much. Um, it's good to know that we were, we were able to move the money around and it's nothing necessarily additional. I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. So I guess what happens with, uh, we're taking the money that was allocated for the quartermaster project. So what happens now? I'd like to just hear just real quick, um, what happens to that project and the costs that were um, associated with that, they're also going to rise just like the this uh, fire station. So what are, I mean, we're going to have to face that at a, at a later date also. So what happens? So Commissioner uh, John Kelly, uh, Buildings and Logistics Director, we have already worked with the CFO and uh, Mr. Lindsay in the budget office that will remove that project to 2023. And we have already put a, a, a buffer dollar amount knowing that the cost will continue. I will say that quartermaster project is kind of a renovation project within a facility instead of coming out of the ground. So those costs per square foot look different than this. It's still all the same thing for construction materials, but we think that for that project, the fire department will be under construction in 2023. Uh, it's already through the budget process to be uh, awarded or not awarded, but that it's approved for those dollars to go in 2023. Allocated towards it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Reginald Lindsay here. Also, the capital schedules, as we all have seen in the last few weeks, the quartermaster in 2023 is already built into those, into those schedules. So just FYI. I'll ask the clerk if there's any other question, comments that were received from the public. No comments were received and no hands online. Thank you. And, and none in the lobby. Thank you. Uh, this is an action item. Uh, committee, uh, and just just for committee's understanding, this is a, above the fifty thousand, but this is a budget um, enhancement for the twenty twenty two year uh, versus the twenty twenty three. You need approval to for us to take it back to the full commission, so that we can put in the million one point five. That is correct. Thank you, committee. Any questions? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk, please call roll. We need a motion. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. I, I do need a motion. Thank you. McKiernan, District 2, move to approve as submitted. Townsend, uh, District 1, second. Yeah, then I got ahead of myself. We do have a motion and a second. Thank you, committee. Uh, I would ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Vote is six to zero. Thank you, committee. That takes us to item number four, which is our second action item of the evening. And this is the resolution for the Rock Island Bridge IRB sales tax exemption. I do believe we have Catherine Carter with us and I'll slow down just a bit so she can get seated and get prepared. But this resolution is the intent to issue industrial revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed 13 million for the benefit of Flying Trust LLC. Ms. Carter, are you ready? Thank you. 
All right. Good evening. Catherine Carter, Director of Economic Development. Um, advance here. So this first item tonight is a resolution, uh, as uh, Chairman Burroughs mentioned, uh, as a resolution of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds uh, for Flying Trust. This is the Rock Island Ridge. Um, this is not the right presentation. Please, if you will indulge me to take two seconds. Do you guys have a flasher? Sorry. Uh, yeah, no revision to the makeup tonight, just a revised PowerPoint. We're good. We, just whenever you're ready. A little easier when I controlled it all myself. So we're getting some, working out some kinks here. Committee, if you have your books with you, it'll be item number five, or I'm sorry, item number four, if you want to read the resolution and um, in case you have any questions. Apologize for this delay. No. Can you promote me? To be just like I'm at home now. All right, there we go. Again, yeah, thank you. Apologize for that. Carter, at your convenience. Thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is uh, industrial revenue bonds for the Rock Island Bridge. Uh, you all have seen the Rock Island Bridge many, many times. This is uh, nothing new. This is something that uh, has been a part of the development agreement for, I believe, literally years now. <laughs> um, so. We are now in the process of working through um, all of those items uh, in order to get them to the point where they are able to uh, close on the bridge. Well, we are able to close on the bridge and then um, they are able to actually start construction. Uh, so what this, uh, the industrial revenue bonds, so it says 13 million, that's the total cost of the entire project. Um, we are not providing 13 million. We that that is we are solely a pass through for uh, them to buy their construction materials. So we all we're doing is providing them a, a certificate of uh, sales tax exemption um, so that they can purchase their uh, their construction materials um, wherever they would like and get that sales tax exemption. Um, there's a, they're looking at about a four million uh, dollars worth of uh, construction materials. So it's 
pretty significant, uh, especially considering there's a lot of steel that is involved um, in those um, in the cantilevers and and actually expanding that bridge. Um, so this would be about a three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar benefit. Um, so again, most of this would not be um, uh, you know money that we are giving away. This is them purchasing materials in other locations, receiving a sales tax exemption, uh, and with our, you know, as if we were to to be the ones purchasing it. Um, just, uh, you know, so you know, uh, kind of looking at this timeline as we move forward, um, they have already, uh, they have their contractors um, and GCs on board. So they are working with um, KCK's own Barkus uh, construction is going to be doing all the steel work, and then Centric will come in, um, which is a metro uh, uh, construction firm to do kind of the finishes. Um, so really excited about that. Um, again, we are looking to actually transfer the bridge from KCMO to uh, the Unified Government's ownership um, in July. So we want to make sure that uh, this is approved as well as their condo plat uh, is going through the Planning Commission and full commission. Um, and once those are done, then uh, all the all the boxes are checked and um, there they should be ready to go. And as soon as that ownership is is transferred, then we'll be um, uh, to a point where we can get their uh, their management agreement finalized. And uh, since we will be the owners of the bridge at that point, and then they will purchase their steel and and start start construction. Does any member of the committee have any questions? Commissioner McKiernan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So refresh my memory, Catherine. 13 million. I thought the total project cost was 5 million. We were going to loan them two. They were going to raise three. That's five. We're done. Where did 13 come from? So we're honestly, we're about at a $10 million. So your, your point is still very well made. Um, there has been a couple different situations. So one, uh, the project has just gotten, I think, bigger and better. Um, so when we look at, you know, when we first had those conversations, if you remember the renderings looked much more simple. Um, so just the project in and of itself has kind of been augmented and, and, uh, I think is, is going to be something pretty, pretty phenomenal. Um, secondarily, inflation, supply chain issues, all, all the things that you have already heard tonight, um, has made a change in about two and a half million dollars uh, in in uh, what their costs were about a year ago. Kind of since we've kind of finalized this general, I mean, their construction drawings are done now, so there's <laughs> there, there's no more uh, augmenting. So, uh, but when they first had their construction uh, drawings nearly done, got a general idea about a year ago, um, that cost has gone up about two and a half million dollars. So per this uh, resolution, they put a little uh, cushion in case, you know, the cost just gets even okay, more. Okay, so just to make sure all of the additional, so we are still in for our original $2 yes. million dollar loan Correct. from Transient Guest Tax Fund. Correct. We are still gonna tiff this for 20 years to get that loan back. Mm -hmm. All, everything above and beyond that $2 million is the developer's responsibility, regardless of how far it goes. 100%. We anticipated it could get as big as 13. So we're going to issue, we're going to authorize IRBs up to 13. Correct. So that they can get the sales tax relief on materials. That is correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? See any hands up? Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Chair. Really quickly, um, thank you so much, uh, Catherine. You, you said bigger and better. And so um, Commissioner McKiernan kind of knocked out some of the logistical questions that I was going to ask, but can you talk about the bigger and better aspect of it, just so our community is notified? Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that question. Um, so when this first came through the commission now, uh, probably two years ago, it was um, still cantilevered out, so that hasn't changed. Um, but really, looking at um, really primarily the the uh, public trail, which again that 
from the UG's perspective, really is the first and foremost priority is that this is a public crossing um, that has retained. Um, but if you look at on this, uh, what's on the screen now, look at that second floor in particular. Um, when this first came through, there was planned to be a second floor. It would have been maybe a fourth of the size of, of what is now being uh, suggested. Um, there are uh, now, I believe, three different restaurants, one um, uh, coffee shop slash bar. Uh, the whole second floor really is an event space, but can also be just a community space and open um, when there is not an event in that location. Uh, so I think they have just created far more opportunities um, for space for people who are just enjoying, you know, on a on a bike ride. Um, but then also you don't see in in this um, uh, this rendering, but a little over to to the right, which would be to the west, uh, there is a whole added section which is kind of a community. Uh, zone and they are having um, bringing offices, uh, so additional cantilevers, so offices for a number of local nonprofits uh, that will actually office on the bridge. Um, so it it really just has uh, expanded to become its own kind of little mini ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just again, to go back to some of this historical stuff on this. So this area was originally broken up into four project areas. As I remember, this was project area four. The IRBs only apply in this particular strip. We had the three that went up the V of land and then we right. had this as the crossing. IRBs only apply here. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. This is solely for the bridge. And just to make sure, I know you've already said this, but I'll say it out loud again. Although these monies are being loaned, these loans are being taken out in the name of the unified government, we are not responsible for them. We will not pay any of them back. The developer will pay every penny of these loans back and not the unified government. They simply get the public benefit since we issue the loans or are the recipient of them that yeah. we get tax um, we get a tax break, so to speak. We don't have to pay sales tax on materials. Uh, correct with one caveat, it, it's even better for us that uh, they, the state has even changed it in recent years so that our name is not even on uh, on any of the final, it, we, we are not the owner of any of these. So even, even uh, in name only, which is how it used to be done. So literally this is just about issuing a certificate that would be in the UG's name that they can use when they buy that steel or so buy even that. even better that we don't backstop this yeah. at all. I want right. to make sure we're clear on that. Um, initially, the developer had some cash flow projections that projected that they would be able to pay back all of their loans in due time. I would assume that they have revised their cash flow projections or their financing projections so that they're confident they can pay back these additional loans. Yes. So, uh, yes, they are. And that it doesn't really, again, kind of affect us. So there's kind of a two, if you're kind of look at this in two different tracks. So we have our $2 million. Um, we would only anticipate that assuming all of this comes to fruition, the way that uh, the construction drawings and everyone is, is planning for, uh, we would anticipate that we would get paid back even faster as there are more amenities, more, more sales to be had. Um, thus, all that sales tax would go to paying paying back the UG for that uh, two million dollars. Um, in terms of the the wider project, um, the uh, uh, Flying Trust LLC uh, has been doing you know pretty astounding work in terms of uh, getting different philanthropic and and others uh, involved. Uh, they even had some you know, shares of the bridge, and they've gotten very creative in terms of uh, what they're doing. But um, yes, all of their uh, projections at this point, uh, they've got a number of grants out and, and such, but um, I think they feel that they're in, in good shape to, to be moving forward. Beautiful. Thank you. I'll ask the uh, clerk if there was any comments received about the project. Oh, Okay, sorry, Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. So uh, like Commissioner McKiernan was saying, that we're not on the hook to, for the payback of those.
but we are making a $2 million loan that is at risk. That absolutely, well, no, they have a surety bond. We're going to get our $2 million back. As my understanding is the original development agreement, we are guaranteed to be returned that with the surety bond that they have taken so that if for whatever reason, and we hope it doesn't, but if this project would not move forward in the way they envision, we will be made whole. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Townsend District 1. Um, good to see you, Ms. Carter, live it in person. Couple of questions. When you mentioned that this has this project has become bigger and better, I was wondering how what was bigger and better that was within the scope of our original development agreement. What about it became bigger and better that did not require um, the developer to come back to the committee? So that's one question. Second question is, will these improvements, is it forecasted that it will lengthen the completion? And you've already made mention of when, ownership will come to uh, the UG. It, did you say that was July? July. July. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. So those are the two questions that I had. Sure. Yeah. So in terms of the the kind of bigger and better, they have stayed within uh, kind of the original scope that, that was approved by the, uh, by the commission. So the actual activities that are happening, uh, none of that has changed, but the you know, entire second floor and kind of augmenting that event space and um, and community space that has gotten substantially bigger, um, adding some of the that um, kind of community space that's not on this uh, this rendering um, that is kind of I think is is new. Um, and then just in terms of I think kind of the finishes, uh, you know. I think once they have seen the type of, and, and a lot of this is with the unified government's uh, kind of stamp of approval, that was, as, as we discussed when this went through, uh, that was really important to a, a whole host of people to make sure that this was something that if the unified government went through and, and kind of did the, the due diligence, that this is something that could be done, uh, you know, then and you know they'll they'll get on board, and so as they've had more and more folks get on board, um, I think there has been a, uh, they've gotten more creative with with the uh, uh, design. So again, this is all locked in now. So the the, the design is no longer uh, you know evolving. Uh, their construction drawings are are complete, and and they have both of their GCs on board and and getting uh, price costs uh, and costs you know, I'll, I'll uh, estimate it out now. Well, part two, will it lengthen these improvements, lengthen the estimated time of completion of the project? Not substantially. So they, uh, their hope would be for uh, this to, you know, break ground um, really this fall. So there, there is a, um, you know, they want to be very careful because the, the steel is, very expensive, um, so I want to make sure that you know again, kind of all all boxes are are checked before they make that order. Um, and there is quite a lengthy um, uh, kind of lead time for for that material in particular. Um, but their hope is that uh, it's about a nine month construction period. So barring kind of crazy weather and all that, their hope is uh, to ideally have this open by next summer. And was that the original expectation? I just don't remember. I, I, yeah, I roughly. About, oh, about <laughs> I can't remember exactly, but it's not totally out of the, uh, you know, totally okay. different. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Uh, Catherine, I only have one question. Down here at the bottom, it says the, um, if we go back to the previous sign, it says the early July ownership transfer from KC Mo the bridge I think we are supposed to be the owner supposed to be purchasing it for a dollar if I remember correctly and that uh, but it, it we won't do it until after the plat is approved by the commission June 30th what does the plat have to do with the bridge so basically we want to make sure that uh, 
everything that we are in control of to to make sure that uh, all the conditions are met for this bridge to move forward and uh, be successful are met prior to us taking ownership of the bridge. Um, so the last thing we wanted was to, um, you know, a year or two ago before we were absolutely sure that this project would move forward, take ownership of the bridge, and then we're the ones kind of stuck with the bridge that there's no project on. So we want to make sure that all of those things, so that includes uh, the item that is in front of you tonight, that is approved uh, to make sure that um, the condo plat, so basically what the condo plat is doing is um, because we are going to be the owners of the bridge, it is a, a tax exempt, you know, uh, parcel. Uh, it's not really a parcel. It gets a little weird with the bridge, but um, but there are going to be specific areas uh, of the bridge that are condoed out like a condominium, you know, apartment or a office building that has different tenants uh, so that those are going to be kind of the, the private uh, side, so those are taxed at a different um, at a different rate than, for example, the the area that is just a, a you know a trail going across the bridge, which you know is kind of public public use. Well, well thank you. The optics of it just don't look good because it it what, the way it reads is that we're advancing the authority for the bridge to go ahead and move forward, but the we're waiting on the condo plat, which if I remember correctly, the condo plat was came before the bridge. If I remember correctly, the development at that side of the, the river. So I'm just kind of curious what one had to do with the other. And so it sounds like we're putting up the money in advance to let them know that the bridge will be, con, will be constructed and there will be that avenue to transport passenger public back and forth across the river to the condo area. So this is actually a condo plat on the bridge. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah sorry, that yeah, if that wasn't clear. So yeah, so the uh, the restaurants, the event space, those will all be condoed out. Uh, it's probably not the technical term, but um, so that they will be taxed at a rate for a private enterprise versus you know the the tax exempt nature of the the trail across the bridge. Great, thank you. Uh, that, that explained it much better. Uh, I'll ask the clerk if there uh, were any comments from the public. No comments are received. No request to speak. Great. Uh, is, I don't believe there's anybody in the lobby. Nope. Okay, th we're going to move on. Uh, this is an action item. I would entertain a motion. McKiernan District Two, move to approve as submitted. We do have a motion and a second. Thank you, committee. I'd ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. The vote is six to zero. Thank you, committee. Okay, now we're going to move on to our item number five, which is an action item this evening. And this is the resolution termination of the Scavuzos Foodie Park. It's easy for you to say. Uh, our next, <laughs> it's, it's authorizing the approval of the termination of the Foodie Park Development Agreement and amendments. And again, I will recognize Catherine Carter, Director of Economic Development. Ms. Carter. Thank you very much, Catherine Carter. Um, I, I will kind of speak to items five and six as they are, are related. Um, they would be two separate votes, uh, however. Um, so as, as Chairman Burroughs mentioned, uh, item five is a resolution terminating the Foodie Park Development Agreement. And item six is an ordinance repealing the 2019 Midtown Development Project area. Uh, so just kind of a reminder, this is the area we're talking about, the former Indian Springs site. Uh, what we had done was break that so that the, there was actually a TIF already there, that, that TIF district had been created. Uh, but in 2019, we uh, kind of amended that uh, with, you know, keeping in mind what um, the Scavuzos plan uh, was, which was kind of had these four different uh, project areas. Um, and indeed, we actually approved project area one, uh, which meant that that clock for that TIF started. Um, so what we would like to do is uh, repeal that project area. Uh, so we'll still, for the moment, have these kind of four project areas that that 
you know, can be changed in the future. So we will keep the TIF in place, um, but kind of wipe clean all the, the, the project areas so that no clock will, we won't waste any uh, uh, of that on, on a project that, you know, is not moving forward um, so that we'll kind of have a blank slate, so to speak, for, for future uh, development at this location. So that's um, kind of item uh, one. Um, then just kind of generally the um, development agreement, um, you know, the unified government has been doing reversionary um, clauses in their development agreements for about 20 years now. Uh, this is the first time we've actually had to, you know, actually use one. Um, so it's a kind of a, a disappointing uh, situation, um, but you know we we don't need to get into kind of all the the reasons that this project will not be moving forward. Um, but suffice it to say, uh, I think everyone is is disappointed. Um, so uh, just so you know, in terms of the development agreement, again, trying to uh, make sure that we're all kind of copacetic and everyone we're getting back to to zero on everything. Um, the big one was um, with, I believe it was the second amendment uh, to the development agreement. Uh, we actually sold them that first tract of land. Uh, it was at the time kind of a, sh a show of, of faith that they were, uh, you know, very serious and things were moving forward. Uh, so just so you know, um, all taxes, they are current on their taxes through 2021. Um, that has all been paid. Uh, then as we um, have the, the property closing, as we get the land back, um, that, you know, we're basically prorating for 2022. So they will continue to pay pay those taxes that, that are owed. Uh, and then we'll get that, uh, that bit at closing. Um, the land will be transferred back to the UG within 15 days of the approval. Um, so this, you know, presumably will go forward to the full commission on uh, June 30th. Uh, thus, we will uh, have the land transferred back no later than July 15th. Um, I will say that there's a, a number of ways that this could have been done. Uh, it, there could have been lengthy litigation and other things to get this property back. Um, but uh, the Scavuzzo family and company uh, have been very good to work with throughout this whole process from the time we were working on, on the project itself to uh, kind of the dismantling of of this, um, so they're voluntarily, you know, giving us back the land and everything as per our agreement. So um, uh, it has been very smooth and happy to answer any questions. I also have uh, Todd Lasala from uh, Simpson, our outside counsel, is is on uh, Zoom as well. If there are any other questions, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Commissioner Stites, Stites District Seven. So when you're saying that they're um, doing everything and being nice about it. So actually they're adhering to the development agreement. Yes. Great. That's not, that's not a given in these situations. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the sale of the land, and this happened prior to me um, becoming on the, on the commission, um, they will still retain that portion of land, correct? No. That reverts, yes. that also. Everything comes reverts back. back so to are you. we, are we reimbursing them? No. For the amount that they paid for the ground? No, they are just giving it back. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments, Commission? Any Commissioner Davis? Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I do want to acknowledge, um, you know, that this is in my district number one, number two. Um, I do want to acknowledge the community nostalgia and. Um, the expectation that we as a unified government do something with this particular property, uh, given the historicity um, that is there. And so I'm hoping to have some, some good news and some opportunity for engagement and partnerships um, to really hear from the community and how we can uh, reimagine this space and work with um, developers so that we can get something that uh, would work for, for everyone. Um, but I do want to, to recognize that um, this is a, a tough loss for us, but hopefully we'll be able to bounce back uh, better. And Catherine Carter's done a phenomenal job given a uh, not so ideal uh, predicament regarding this development. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Any other comments from committee? 
seeing none, just for clarification, uh, Commissioner Stite, you were absolutely correct. The property does revert back to us, and we're only talking about Project Area 1 was the property that will be coming back to us. That was the original property, I believe, of the warehouse uh, potential that was to be developed there. So we've, we've come up with a solution that reverts property back to us. Taxes are paid, and we can look forward to a, an opportunity for future development of that property through public discourse. Uh, is there any members of the public wishing to speak to this item? No comments were received, no request to speak. Great, thank you. Um, with that, committee, I'd entertain, these are two action items. We talked about both. I would like to separate them and do a vote on each one. And the first one will be the termination of the Scavuzo Foodie Park uh, resolution. So if uh, I would ask the clerk to please call roll on the first item, and that's the termination of we need a motion. I need a motion. Need a motion. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion, Chair, to uh, move as submitted. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. McKeeran and District 2, second. So we do have a motion and a second. Committee, I would ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Vote Thank you, committee. That takes us to item six which is the ordinance repealing the 2019 Midtown Redevelopment Project Plan. I believe Ms. Carter gave an overview of that uh, as she was explaining the project. So uh, even though these two are tied together, I do need a separate motion. So I'd entertain a motion. A motion to approve and submit it, Commissioner Davis. McKeeran in District 2, second. Thank you. Thank you, committee members. We have a motion and a second. I would ask clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Vote is six to zero. Thank you, committee. Uh, I know the Scavuzzo has been an issue before us for quite a while. I'm pleased to see that we were able to find a remedy that satisfied both entities. That's commendable. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, the next item is a is a resolution, item number seven. It is an action item also. And committee, we're we're closing in on halfway through the agenda. Uh, our is it, it, it the next, next item is a resolution approving a special project application for a rebate on incremental property taxes pursuant to the Neighborhood Revitalization Act plan for the redevelopment of the Brotherhood Bank building at 753 State Avenue. And Catherine Carter, you will be making the presentation again. You are the economic director, uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, once again, this is one that has a, a few different items kind of attached to it. So um, I will kind of give a bit of an overview. Uh, Kurt Peterson, the attorney for uh, the client, uh, uh, for the developer um, from uh, Polsonelli is here to also speak to it, uh, as is the developer. Um, Kevin Carnes is on Zoom somewhere. Uh, so as a just quick uh, kind of overview, and I'll, I'll speak to items, I guess I should, should back up here. I'll speak to items uh, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, so item seven is the resolution to approve the neighborhood revitalization special project application. Uh, item number eight is the resolution of intent to issue sales tax exemption on construction materials for the project. Uh, and then uh, item number nine, uh, is actually a option a real estate purchase for the building next door. So uh, I'll kind of give a give an overview, and then we can either break these up or I kind of there's a number of ways to to kind of move forward. So um, the Brotherhood Bank is uh, the largest building actually uh, in our downtown. Um, it is on the corner of Eighth uh, and Minnesota, and actually goes all the way back the entire width of uh, that, that block. So it, it's on both Minnesota and state. Um, so you can see there's this first section uh, up front right on Minnesota that was, I believe 1915 is when that was uh, built. And then it is actually connected to the building you see behind it, uh, which was uh, built as a expansion in the forties. Um, this whole time it has been a, a office space. Um, the, the section here on Minnesota has been largely vacant for, for many years. Um, about 
three years ago, uh, a group called KDG uh, purchased the building from the Brotherhood Bank. Um, they have been interested in uh, renovating this building and went through the painstaking process of uh, getting this building on the historic register. So it is on the historic register, both with the state and the uh, federal registers. Um, through that process, they are eligible for historic tax credits and are moving forward with that process. Um, so what their uh, desire is, is to uh, keep a, a large amount of office space uh, in this building, which is great news for us, as I believe uh, there is a, a dearth of uh, high quality office space in our downtown. Um, so having this be renovated and, and brought up to a, a, a certain grade will be uh, really positive, I think, for our downtown. Um, and additionally, they're interested in putting uh, 29 residential units. Uh, most likely those will be here in this, um, uh, the older building there on Minnesota. Uh, overall, this is uh, just under a $21 million investment. Um, so this is quite a significant investment uh, in our downtown. Um, so a couple of things, um, I will take the, I'll just keep going. Um, I'll kind of talk about the first two items, uh, you know, kind of as, as one. Uh, so first is the Neighborhood Revitalization Act. So you all don't see this very often as the vast majority of uh, NRA projects. It is really focused on uh, projects that are $3 million and under. Uh, this is you know, really uh, used for uh, renovations of, of small offices, uh, renovations of homes, building new homes um, in our community. So you only see it every three to five years when we kind of bring the, that large uh, policy in front of you and um, go on a whole road show and get all the different taxing jurisdictions approval. Um, there is a, a, a special project area, which is um, a, not very used because it's very specific about what can uh, fit into this. Um, so when you're talking about this kind of special project area plan, um, they have to be in a specific area. So project area one, which is generally um, east of 635, um, or we have a couple kind of corridors that are also uh, included in that. Um, the project would have to be on the historic uh, register, uh, state and federal, or, or federal, I guess. Uh, again, a couple other, if there's significant environmental remediation um, or significant retail components. So again, it is, is very specific uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, what type of projects can be used for this. Uh, and then it's over a $3 million investment. So we're looking at larger investments for this. Um, and the applicant cannot be tax delinquent, of course. Um, so this is, uh, in my time, only the second project uh, to come forward to uh, ask for this kind of NRA uh, special area. And so the difference is in the normal NRA with the smaller mm -hmm. projects, you're talking about a 95% rebate. Um, these are rebates, not abatements. Um, uh, over 10 years, this provides for, because it is really looked upon as something very catalytic, um, this provides the opportunity to get 75% rebate, um, again, on just the increase in the property value. So that base in uh, what they are currently paying in property taxes. So in 2021, they paid uh, just about $145,000. That will not change. They will, they will always pay their, their base in property taxes. So that rebate will be on the, the increase due to the work that was done on the property. Um, so that would be a 75% rebate for 20 years. Um, we do have some uh, pretty significant local minority and women-owned business goals. Um, if they do meet those goals, they have the opportunity to go to an 85% abatement, sorry, rebate. Um, so again, they would continue to pay their, their current tax base uh, and just receive that, that rebate on the incremental property due to that investment. Um, and then the, the second item is, uh, as we talked about with the bridge, uh, this would be a sales tax exemption on construction materials. So again, unified government would not be, um, uh, you know, liable or taking any 
you know, uh, or any responsibility for any of those uh, costs. Again, this would just be providing that sales tax um, certificate that says that they do not need to, to pay that. So I will pause Pause there. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question. Commissioner Stites. Commissioner Stites, District 7. So 75% abatement, 85% if LMW goals are met. What if they're not met? Then it would be 75. Just, so there's there's no LMW um, requirements. It's just this incentive if you that's correct. If you make it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how the policy was was okay. stated. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Catherine, do you, you have more? I will turn it over to Mr. Peterson to see if he has anything to add at this point. Welcome, Mr. Peterson. Hi, Mr. Chairman. It's oh, sorry, Commissioner. We have a, Commissioner Townsend. Sorry, before you start. Yeah. So, sorry, Council, but this this dovetailed into the uh, question that Commissioner Stites uh, asked about the um, um, LBE MWWBE in the original, I guess. This commission saw this in 2020, right. and there was no LMB WB requirement. Wait, I'm sorry. Oh. I saw something on the, the screen that just said, was this approved in some form back in 2020? The policy, the uh, uh, neighborhood revitalization policy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not this. Okay. So my question goes to, there is no requirement for the use of LBE, WMBE, WBE. That's correct. But it's highly incentivized. I mean, it, it would make sense for them to, to do so. And I think they have every uh, uh, you know, plan to, to follow through on that. It, it just strikes me as unusual. That, that there's no requirement. We're just following uh, the policy. I'm sorry? I say it's just, that was how the commission approved the policy. Oh, the policy though for the uh, NRA. Yes. And that policy says there's no requirement. Correct. Okay. So someone seeking this may or may not avail themselves of that. That's correct. That's the incentive. It would okay. be beneficial to them to, to do so, okay. but they're not required. Hmm. Well, as I read this, that, that answered my question as to, you know, why there was an additional incentive. Um, and it seems as though since this act most commonly is used in disadvantaged areas of the city anyway, mm -hmm. Um, that there should have been some requirement. So maybe that's something we need to go back and revisit. Yeah, we certainly can. Uh, but thank you. That that was it then. Commissioner Davis has his hand up. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Thank you, Chair. And I uh, agree, could not agree more with Commissioner Townsend and Commissioner Stites. I think um, perhaps we have a new item that uh, could be brought forward to this a standing committee at some point to review, um, and I think we need another name, <laughs> the Neighborhood Revitalization Act, especially in 2022. Um, but but maybe we can look at re renaming it and look at right uh, whether or not we should include some sort of mandated uh, LMW goals. And just for the community, LMW, local minority women-owned business participation, that's what we are discussing. Um, Catherine, are there any pilot payments along with this? And are there any community benefits beyond the project itself? So the way that the Neighborhood Revitalization Act works, uh, there, yeah, there would not be any uh, payment in lieu of taxes every year. What happens, and this is the same if the uh, project is, you know, kind of your normal run of the mill, you know, someone's putting some investment into their home um, or something like this, which is, uh, you know, kind of um, a little different. 
what would happen is every year that that project pays their entire um, uh, tax bill, and then they receive a rebate on again just you know a certain percentage. Uh, so in this case, 75 or 85 percent of that incremental uh, property tax, and so they would receive uh, that that back. Um, uh, then, of course, the the unified government would receive that that base. So in this case, about 140 thousand a year, as well as um, whatever that amount, uh, you know, again, either 15 percent or or 25 percent of that that increased um, uh, appraisal um, or assessed value. For gotcha. the so, there, so there is going to be an increase at the very least into the tax base. Correct. If this development kind of is successful and, and does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And I will say in terms of just kind of that community benefit, um, you know, as I, as I kind of touched on a briefly earlier, uh, this is really filling an uh, area of need that we have in our downtown um, and for a variety of reasons have not been able to uh, to see the type of development um, to move potentially as fast as, as we would like. Um, so what this will be bringing that I think, you know, is kind of, uh, I'm sure there are ways to quantify it, but, it, you know, for today, it's a, a little unquantifiable uh, in terms of providing, you know, good quality office space in our downtown. Um, and then also, you know, providing market rate uh, apartments. This will be kind of a, a bit of a first in, um, you know, we'll have a, a few uh, apartments that will have already uh, opened by that time um, with the Boulevard lofts, but this would be kind of that first kind of sizable market rate, um, uh, you know, residential project that I think will, um, you know, hopefully prove what we all think is that there is quite a bit of demand uh, for market rate uh, and other residential in this area. Um, and so then hopefully that will open up to uh, a lot of other things. And, you know, I think a, a big thing that at least I've been working on, and I think a lot of people have been focused on is trying to get additional density in our downtown and what that does uh, in terms of, you know, sustaining the residential or the retail that we have, uh, and then also bringing new and, and kind of increasing the level of that. And then just, just last question, um, in the event that the LMW goals are um, uh, completed, what are the percentages that we're, we're looking at for this? There, uh, we'll find those for you in just a second, but Okay. Um, they are our normal, uh, our normal percentages for um, that you see in in all of our big development agreements. Okay, so it was like seven or fifteen or something between there for each one. Eight, eight, okay, eight. thank you so yeah. much, Chair. Yeah, sure. Okay, I have Commissioner Stites and then Commissioner Townsend. Commissioner Stites. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Stites. Commissioner McKiernan was before you, so I'm oh, going to well. back up. Go ahead, sir. Commissioner McKiernan. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just want to, to go back and, and revisit a little bit of our conversation about the NRA and, and its history, because I want to make sure everybody's clear on this. The whole purpose behind this was to spur some growth mm -hmm. in our stock, so to speak, our building stock in especially these areas. And anything that a property was already paying, it would pay 100% of that after its improvement. And then to incent to give an incentive to the property owner to make that improvement, we would agree to rebate some percentage of the incremental taxes, the taxes that ordinarily would be added on uh, as, a, as a function of that property becoming more valuable and making more taxes. And we say, tell you what, you're gonna make these improvements. Here's what we're gonna do to help you make them. We will give you a rebate on the incremental property tax for the first 10 years. That'll help you fund the improvements. But I think when we were talking about the NRA a couple of years ago, we were more thinking about smaller developers, maybe individuals and not development companies. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think LMW necessarily entered, not that it shouldn't, but I don't know that we thought about LMW incentives in that way because we're thinking about just George, 
and he's exactly. going to improve his building. And we didn't want to either put the administrative overhead on nor saddle George, who's not maybe doesn't have the capacity to do that with meeting those additional um, criteria benchmarks. If we're actually drilling down, they're probably under a hundred thousand uh, dollars in terms of the amount. You know, it's a it's the majority are owners who uh, you know live in their home and want to make some improvements. Uh, and if they see a fifteen percent increase in that assessed value, they you know get that that benefit that rebate back on on that increase, uh, as the commissioner said. Um, so again, this is only, at least in the last four years, this is uh, only the second of these that is a, a larger project because there is such specific uh, qualifications to get in that, that uh, to be eligible for, for a project like this. So, um, and I believe only the third project that, that the UG has, has approved uh, over the existence, but um, the Y lofts is the other uh, so again, a historic building that was. Uh, uh, and then, uh, so I would suggest I would suggest to the committee that we consider the next time we revise, review, and revise this policy that we consider some sort of a threshold. That if you exceed that threshold, then there is an automatic expectation that you will meet LMW requirements, mm -hmm. and that if you're below that or some other qualifications exist then you are not mandated, but encouraged to. So I would just throw that out as a suggestion with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. McKernan. Uh, Commissioner Stites. Commissioner Stites, District 7. Well, the last part you added there, Commissioner McKernan, we'll scratch, I'll scratch off number one, because mm -hmm. that's exactly what I was gonna say. There should be some sort of threshold benchmark once we reach that, that uh, LMW kicks in and those requirements. Now, I am quite confident um, knowing and uh, Mr. Peterson and that your our concerns as using local LMW will be relayed to the developer and that how how passionate we are about those goals um, and, and utilizing our local minority and women owned businesses in Wyandotte County. And I appreciate when if you will relay that information. Thank you. Commissioner, knowing this body, knowing the commissioner that was just speaking, anticipated this discussion and already relayed, but we'll relay again. Mm -hmm. Great. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you. Um, Ms. Carter, uh, council, I know this may be several years in the actual completion, and you mentioned price, well, that this is market rate. Just to give our audience some idea, in this body, what would market rate be if this project were completed now, just to have some idea? Say a one bedroom apartment at 7th and State, what would that run? Kurt Peterson here on behalf of the applicant commissioner. Uh, one, you have to give the caveat when there's a lot of people listening that they don't run with one sentence in the newspaper or something like that. Market rate, as you, I know you know this, market rate is set by the market. So you can build whatever you want to build. And the number of people that are willing to come to that unit based on everything that's available in the area and that's competing with your product will truly determine what your rate is. You can set your rate, but if it's too high, nobody will rent and you'll have to drop, drop the rate down. So with that as the obligatory but important caveat, I would say the goal definitely as, and, and if the chairman says in a minute, when you all are, are finished with the initial questions, I'll give a little, bit, a little bit more of a brief presentation that'll give a little bit more meat to this, but you're asking the question now, I would say the target is definitely try to get the downtown residential market above $1.50 a square foot. And let's go up from there because that's when the, the floodgates in my, my world, right, of, of multifamily, that's when the floodgates open and we can start to get more and more investment downtown. Uh, that's when, when, so when we quote like that, we're talking about the average. So if there's, let's say something had one bedrooms and two bedrooms, you would take the average square foot and you'd say, well, the average would be a dollar 50. If it's a bigger amount of space, usually your, your dollars per square foot goes down and vice versa. So that's your, that's an meant to be an average, average number since we're not talking specifics. 
Right. And I don't want to tie you down, but just in my mind. So, and this may be in your presentation, what's your expectation or plan with square footage though for these units? And then you could take that dollar fifty multiplier. Sure. So for easy math for everybody, for myself included, take a take a take a thousand square foot unit times a, a buck fifty and you'd get your fifteen hundred dollars. Yes, ma'am. Committee, any other questions? Ms. Carter, I think we're only talking about 29 residential units, correct? Correct. Just wanted the committee to understand how many of those units were there. Mr. Peterson, you were going to speak earlier. Did you have something you wanted to add to the conversation? I think to augment, Chairman, if I can, just because we've been working on this for so many months, this is our opportunity. Uh, but if, if I can be brief and augment, I will. If you can be brief, you can. <laughs> well, 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 I will say, well, 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 I'll actually say this as I look at y'all. If we are all... Uh, feeling good about this project and what's proposed. And I, I don't want to say another word. How about that? Commissioner Stites, District 7, motion to approve as submitted. McKiernan and District 2, second. So I do have a motion in a second. I do need to ask if there's any comments from the public. No comments were received. We do have some here that want to speak. I, I want to say thank you. you you'll, I'll now recognize members of the public who wish to address the committee. You will have to be given three minutes and uh, to make your comments. And I'll ask the clerk if there are any hands, which we know that there's not any downstairs at this time, that you'll have three minutes. Please state your name and your place of residence. And uh, the clerk will monitor the time. Thank you, commissioners. There we go. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Jason Norbury. I'm the executive director for Downtown Shareholders of Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, we are located at 726 Armstrong in KCK. Uh, I, I wanted to just briefly touch on um, items seven and eight and say that as, as an organization, we have actually talked about the project um, and we think the project, at least as we have seen the proposal so far, and I obviously realize that we are there are a lot of details to come, um, is, is an excellent concept um, adding one of the things that I have preached since I came on board four years ago um, about downtown the best way to revitalize downtown is to increase the number of people in it uh, by improving the office stock and adding residential stock it does exactly that um, our master plan uh, really details our things on multi-use development um, and having a ground floor with a with a long-standing bank I don't I think there's any plans on that changing and then having upstairs full of office and residential really meets that goal. We are, however, um, as sort of the stewards of the downtown, and, and I, I will say this as a whole, um, shareholders doesn't take a lot of stances on individual incentive projects. Um, that's not our strength in Bailiwick. We'll leave that to uh, Catherine and Greg Kendall to work on things like that, that they, they have in there. However, as stewards of the uh, of the master plan, we do have one concern and a fairly strong concern, and that is with item nine on the agenda, the uh, proposed option of the building at 742. And as once again, with limited information, uh, my understanding from the agenda is that the proposed use of that would be to demolish the building and put in its place surface parking lot. Uh, as bluntly as I can put it, that is a terrible terrible idea from an urban planning standpoint. It goes against virtually every major kind of measure we have of good downtown development. It goes against the uses of the master plan. Um, it will put a hole in a- One minute remaining. In one of the only blocks in downtown that has not been uh, sort of hammered by destruction of a building for either service parking lot or nothing uh, in its place. I think there are other solutions. The developer does own properties to the west and behind the uh, subject property at 742. So I think that there's got to be a solution for parking for the residential units on hand. Um, but to tear down that building with only the plan to put a surface parking lot in its place is something that downtown shareholders cannot support and would encourage you to hold on that option until a more suitable plan is in place. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, at the right time, I'd like to respond when you allow. Sure. Uh, we haven't got to item nine just yet. That That's an item we haven't discussed, but I, it is part of this discussion. So I'm going to allow those that want to speak to that to speak to it. Uh, committee, uh, it'll be the next item up as we discuss this project. As, she, as Catherine Carter stated, they're, they're all three tied together. 
But right now we're on item set, uh, item seven and eight specifically. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to speak to those two items? And if you want to approach and, and you please your name and place of residence, and you have three minutes. I'm Shirley Carter Alford. I live at uh, 804 South. I Shirley Carter Alford. I live at 804 South 89th Street, Kansas City, Kansas, 66111. I am appalled that there was nothing wrote in about how many minorities was going to be in the project. I do not like that by being a minority myself. I want to commend uh, Councilwoman Townsend and Councilman David for bringing that up because that never should have been overlooked if you were wanting to do something good for the inner city of Wyandotte County in Kansas City, Kansas. I'm just appalled at this. I would like to ask the council to think this over before you vote, talk to them about it afterwards, see if they write something in, not voice stuff. You gotta write it down in black and white. And this should be done because this is the inner city of Kansas City, Kansas. And if you're going to do it, let them do it. Do it right. And get somebody on their board to help with that project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, we did have, uh, Mr. Peterson, did you want to make a comment? Uh, before we, we have the motion and a second on the floor on item number seven, if I remember correctly, to approve item number seven. That's correct. Council? That's correct. If you have no and, comments, Ms. Carter? Yeah, just to, um, just to once again kind of clarify, so the uh, the, as part of the agreement that is uh, in your packet and what you are voting on today. Uh, there are goals for LMW participation uh, for professional services. It's 18% local, 13% uh, minority, and 8% women. For construction, it's 18% local, 15% minority, and 7% uh, women-owned businesses. Again, uh, as we mentioned, while not a requirement, uh, it certainly behooves the developer to uh, to meet these goals as it gives them an additional 10% uh, to their to their rebate. So that's um, a real benefit over the course of, of 20 years. Um, so again, something that I, I certainly support in looking at the uh, the policy as we move forward, but just so we're clear, you know, there are goals on this project and, and how those would work. Great. Thank you. Any comments? Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, uh, uh, Townsend District 1. I just wanted to, in response to Ms. Eichert, who's been a long time active uh, constituent, well, not my constituent, but a constituent of Wyandotte County. She's not a late to the table um, citizen, and I appreciate her input. And, and I got to know her about eight years when I first came on. But just for clarity's sake, um, I think what Commissioner McKiernan and, and Stites and all of us have been talking about is looking at the plan that this is coming under um, so that you so that we as a commission um, look at again the do's and don'ts and the requirements of the Neighborhood Revitalization Act itself. I think as Commissioner McKiernan mentioned. Uh, that's usually used on smaller scale items and not really contemplated for this, but there have been uh, safeguards put in this action, but I appreciate your, your comments. So I, 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 for one, and I think several other commissioners have already expressed their support for looking at that act and going back. So uh, we're clear in the future on these projects, but thank you for your input as far as I know, over the last eight or nine years. So appreciate your input. Commissioner Davis. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Eichert, for your uh, comment. And I believe those Commissioner Stites had also brought it up. So, so 
uh, want to, to recognize that as well. So I think we have our, our marching orders. I'm in support of this particular project. And, and my vote, just so the developer is aware of this, of Mr. Peterson, is that you would you know, get those LMW goals are, are, are met. Um, but I think there are three things, right? Just so we can reiterate this for the community, right? We need to look at that name, goodness. Um, <laughs> we need to look at a cap, right? And then we need to look at mandating LMW goals as a part of this uh, of legislation. Um, and so just so the community is aware of what we are doing, um, that is kind of where my vote is. It's with the, those particular expectations. And uh, it's my hope that we get uh, this back on the agenda so that we can make those adjustments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. I think there has been, it's been reiterated by members of this committee that that is an important element in development for our community as we move forward. So I don't believe there's any one commissioner who doesn't support it. I believe it's significant and important that our community is reflected in developments as we move forward. So um, uh, I, I'm pleased we had this discussion in, in a public forum so that it can be discussed and brought out openly and get the commitment of the commission to look into doing whatever requirements are necessary with the NRA to meet the needs of the community and the development associated to it. We do have a, a motion and a second on the table. We need action on this item. And just so everyone understands, this is item number seven alone, the resolution for the Brotherhood Bank Building NRA uh, agreement. So with that, I'll ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. The vote is six to zero. Thank you, committee. Now, item number eight is the $12 million of finance costs for the sales tax exemption on construction costs. I believe, Catherine Carr, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Just uh, very simply that this is uh, similar to what we discussed with the Brock Island Bridge. So again, we are solely talking about a sales tax exemption on construction materials. We're just using the industrial revenue bonds as kind of the, the mechanism to, to provide that, that certificate. Um, uh, so this is not touching any property tax at all. That's Thank you. I, uh, any comments? Any comments from the public? None were received. Unreceived. Thank you. The uh, I, I'd really like to say I thought this was a very innovative approach to help this project move forward, uh, to have a meet certain criteria to incentivize the participation of LMW. But just the way it's putting to the NRA is put together allows us to recoup present tax base and then get the in incremental utilize it as our exemptions for uh, additional improvements of buildings. I think that's a very novel idea. So I commend uh, this, this project and how it was put together. I would entertain a motion for item number eight, the $12 million IRA approval, IRB, sorry. McKiernan, District 2, move to approve as submitted. Sounds in second. Please call roll. roll call. Haley? Aye. Was that an aye? Aye. Yes. Thank you. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. The vote is six to zero. Thank you, committee. That takes us to item number nine uh, that I believe we will have a little bit of discussion about. And so, Catherine Carter, please, uh, on the real estate purchase agreement for 742 Minnesota. Sure. So I will just open, uh, just kind of give an overview and then um, turn it over to Mr. Peterson. Uh, so, again, this is uh, related to the two items that were just approved. Um, there has been a request by the developer to purchase the, uh, the building immediately to the east of the Brotherhood Bank building. Um, this is a uh, building that the unified government owns currently and has for a number of years. Um, some may remember it uh, many moons ago as the uh, former EPA building, the old, old EPA building, as it were, in our community. Um, it is a, a building that has 
gone through, uh, we've looked to see if there is, um, you know, p- possibility for historic tax credits. Uh, and that has been, we've had a, a number of different folks come out and look at that and um, feel pretty confident that the answer, unfortunately, is no. Uh, there's been a lot of changes to this building made over, over the years, so that it would not be eligible. Um, so again, their, uh, their request is to, to sell this building. They would uh, demolish the, the current building. They already own the parking lot behind, which has actually been another um, issue in terms of trying to get this building uh, uh, renovated over the, the many decades. Uh, and uh, they would like to build some additional parking specifically for their residential. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Chairman, nice to be in person with you all after two and a half years. <laughs> I, somebody's got to say it, right? <laughs> Pretty amazing. <laughs> Back in the room. Um, I'm Kurt Peterson here on behalf of KDG, who is the applicant here, as, uh, as you've heard tonight. To make quality residential work, we have to have proximate and safe, and I say safe, but perceived safe and actually safe parking for these residential units. I can tell you as, I guess, an industry expert, right, with all the multifamily that we do, both in the region and nationally, that it is undeniably true. You will not get people to live in a place unless they have, like I said, close and safe and always parking, period. And I will say I will. I could go on and on. It's something I'm really interested in and have devoted a lot of time to, and I won't, uh, but I will just make the statement emphatically. I believe and have put a lot of time in, not even always when we have clients, into thoughts with uh, Greg Kendall and others about how can downtown uh, KCK get to a place where it was long before I was around, right? How can, I mean, it is, I know it's possible. And we've tried a lot of different ways. And like I said, insert a long 10 minute, right? Monologue right there about passion about that. But here's the point, kind of the summary conclusion on that, which is, I know for a fact, it will never happen. It will happen. It will never happen without quality residential downtown. Not a few units, but a lot of units. And you can't do that until investors with real hard cash believe they can get rents, right? And, and I, it's, it's one thing to come in with these 29 units. This is, this is a risk for this developer, big time, but they believe in it. And they have this building and they're doing a lot of office with it. They're going to go for this. And they slowly, when they go, wow, they lease this up and they got X dollars per square foot. That's what goes, to, I go to my other clients and say, are you ready to do 100 units now? I think we can do it. After that, this is real. You come into with 300 units and $60 million, but it doesn't, you can't go zero to 60. You have to be incremental. So there's my, my prefatory speech and why I personally think this is really compelling what's about to happen. So you got to have the parking though. So we investigated, wh- where do you get the parking? You can't get the parking off to the West, it's just off the screen to the left there. All of that parking is owned by KDG kind of next to McDonald's there. And what is it used for? Because you also have to have good parking for good office. It's completely <laughs> utilize or will be when the office is full after the renovation for the office. The parking just to the, I call it the South Tower and the North Tower. That North Tower is the taller one up on state. Just to the east of that, as Ms. Carter is pointing out with the cursor, they also own that. Guess what that's used for? The office and particularly one specific tenant that that's a very important part of their lease. So the question is, if you believe that you have to have the parking to put the really good residential in, where do you put the parking? Our first choice was not to go next door to the building that we're talking about, just to the east, as the cursor will indicate, of the south building. But we do believe it is the only real solution here. At first, we had engineers and contractors go over and spend real money and time on saying, wow, could we keep the shell of that building so that it has the frontage and you put parking behind it? And we came forward, as I know Ms. Carter will attest, because we have written uh, bids and analyses that were done there. And I'll keep it short on that, Chairman, because you'll ask questions if you have them. It's not, it absolutely isn't feasible, which is consistent really with Ms. Carter's experience. Again, not putting words in her mouth. I've just talked to her a lot about it, about how many people have come to try to refurbish, renovate this building. And they find it doesn't work because structurally it's not quote unquote worth it. It's not feasible to put a bunch of money into the way that the way that it exists today. The other key piece here is it's also has no. People above me make this statement. I'm repeating it. It has no historical significance, right? It's not. It's not. Uh, it, it's not on any sort of registered federal or state. 
And the reason is because it's been so butchered over time, right, with facade work and redos. So it doesn't have the, the significance uh, historically. So when we investigated the amount of parking that could be put on that site, if the building wasn't there, we were very, very fortunate to find it absolutely does meet the parking needs of the residential. So it works without that building. There. But again, please understand it's not where we started. And I know many of you, I'd be shocked if you didn't have initial hesitancy. Again, I'm a, they come down, I, I know downtown, we don't tend to want to go knock down buildings, but we don't propose this lightly is my point. It's not where we started and it wasn't without investigation. So the residential component of this project can't happen without this part of, you know, this item nine. Um, it's infeasible to renovate, as I said, and not historically significant. So I would propose this sort of paradigm that probably is different from either what you're thinking now or what you came into the meeting thinking, which is, I'd say this is the paradigm. We are trading up on this situation. It's a trade. You have to give up one good player. My One of my favorite Royals players will be traded, I'm sure. But we're going to trade up, we think, right? Or we wouldn't do it. This is a trade. And it's a trade that we contend is absolutely worth it. And furthermore, I would say this. This isn't a promise, but it's coming from industry expertise. And this very developer has plans for the future. If we can prove out this market, this is a perfect site for the long term to get rid of the surface parking lot have there be parking with a podium above it, and then you build your apartments. We do that all over the metro. But what do you need to make that happen? You have to have the rents to support it. How do you get the rents to support it? You have to start somewhere and start to build that market to show lenders and to show investors that it'll work. So this is a stepping stone. So in terms of logistics, kind of closing on this point, Chairman, on the logistics of this transaction, what we're calling an option agreement, which is effectively a purchase agreement, right? The ability to buy this site from the UG. Um, we proposed a purchase price, which I think is important to get on the record and get some discussion going, of $181,000. You say, well, where'd you come up with $181,000? This site, although in UG ownership right now, has accumulated, I forgot to look how many years, lots of years of back taxes that just haven't been paid. That would completely wipe out all the back taxes and get this back to kind of clean title. Um, one of you might say, two of you might say, all of you might say in your mind, well, you want to pay you, you want to pay more than that? Can we go above 181,000? Fair question, right? And we can talk about it. But I would just say right out of the gate, think about it. I would ask that you think about it this way from this perspective. This is an over $20 million construction project, which don't even talk about the soft cost, by the way, and, and the historic purchase of the building. It's it's much bigger than that. But the construction is over $20 million. I sat here tonight, and it's always interesting to hear. The UG, from its perspective on its projects, right, with the fire station and things like that. Did you hear the bridge 25% increase in, in cost? Can I just insert all of that discussion? This is really hard. These folks have been planning this project for three years. They have their federal and state historic tax credits ready to go. They have their lender not closed because we have to do this part. This is a this is a this is a big deal. So I would say think of it this way. The building right now, clearly to the market, people have approached Ms. Carter and her staff. They can't figure it out. The building ultimately, I'm going to say based on that, and it probably has to come down. Even tearing down the building is expensive, right? And any abatement you need to do, environmental, whatever you have to do, that's really expensive. So I would argue there's even a liability to taking on the building and incorporating into this project. So that is a request, Mr. Chairman, in closing, to please carefully consider what is not a first choice, but I think is a trade up for the unified government and hopefully a ripple in the long-term effect um, that we'll have on downtown. And we would ask that you consider the purchase price of these back taxes of $181,000, but I'd love to dialogue and answer any questions you have or anybody on the committee. Commissioner Stites. Stites, District 7. How long has that building been vacant right now? I mean, how, do we know how many years it's been setting vacant? I think at least 20. So 20 years, vacant building. And do we have any kind of like an estimated reno cost um, the way it stands right now? And the way I have, uh, well, I've understood that this building is kind of past that stage that you could uh, renovate it, that it would, the, the cost way outweigh, you know, sometimes people remodel houses and they think they're going to go in there and you know, gut it and start start over, and they go, boy, I wish I would have just doged this thing. So my co question is, do yeah. we have, is it is it past the point of 
somebody coming in and renovating it. So I, I will uh, put the, the huge caveat first that I am not a construction professional. Um, however, I have uh, attempted, this has been a bit of my white whale working here, trying to get uh, someone to uh, actually take this building and renovate it. So I have shown it to a lot of people. Um, and I will say that there are uh, a, a few different um, issues. One, at some point there is this uh, addition, if you can see my cursor added, um, so that was not part of the original building. Basically, the entire wall, just anytime it rains, water just seeps in through that wall. So that would have to be either uh, demolished or completely rebuilt. Um, there is an elevator in the building that would, of course, have to be completely redone. HVAC, um, electrical, it, it's a, a bit of a blast from the past when you go in there and, and look at uh, how they were plugging things in at the time because it's, you know, wouldn't be able to plug anything in today. So it, it would be, uh, I mean, it, you would have to take it down to the, to the studs. And um, so anyone that I have taken in there uh, kind of comes in excited at the prospect of, of getting a, a, a building downtown. And then in the end, it has been fairly consistent that um, by actual professionals that uh, it is not, not worth the, the money. How many parking spots would this uh, utilize? Or I mean, I believe it is forty-seven. Us. How many? I believe forty-seven. Yes. So forty-seven, and so I'm going to round up to twenty-nine. It makes it easier on any housing division that are uh, that we would we would ask for a parking spot and a half for thirty, which makes forty-five. Easy math, you know. So this exactly meets what is needed for the residential component of this uh, project, right? Is that correct? A spot and a half is what our codes say? I believe so. Look at our parking. Okay, our Gunner's in the back shaking his head no. No, I don't know. At least I think he is or he was choking on his mask. Gunner Hendrick are planning to resign. This is zone CD, no parking is required for residential. Okay, but I'm, I'm saying that we would, on, on other projects, a, a parking spot and a half is what our code says, correct? And I'm another development that we've been talking about on Central, per se. Uh, Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Urban Design, it averages around one. If you get up to two bedrooms, it's one and a half. Okay, okay. So it, and I will tell you, there is nothing more frustrating than to try and go do business at the annex out west or the go to the soccer game or go to a restaurant and you drive around, or you come down here to pay your tags or get your pay your taxes and you drive around for an hour to try to find somewhere to park. It's frustrating. And I I am I I would I would think that we would be doing a disservice to this project if we didn't allow them ample parking spaces to make everybody that wants to come in there utilize the office space and for the residents to have a spot that they can pull in off the street and go to their home. And again, their home, not parked on the street, not parked down in, the, in an alley a half a block away, but right there where they live. I'm totally in support of this. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Commissioner McKernan? Thank you. I've told Ms. Carter, I've told the developer, now I'll tell Mr. Peterson. I just am not in favor of approving this sale nor this demolition. Now, it's not to say I won't do it. I just, it, it's, it's kind of amazing that we talk about, well, you can build up your downtown and all you got to do is tear half of it down. Yeah. That just doesn't seem like the way we want to go on this. And so that's the problem I'm having getting over this. We have a, a block here. The 700 block is almost completely populated in terms of buildings. Directly across the street to the south from this building, there is that giant pit where there used to be a building, and it's gone now. But that's the only gap. Well, I'm sorry. Next to the Economic Development Council chamber building, there's also a gap. But there are very few gaps in this block. And I am reluctant to introduce more gaps, regardless of the benefit that it might bring. Not to say that 
I wouldn't ultimately go along with it, but I, I just, I have a, a real problem with that. Ms. Carter, have we ever actually put this building on the open market, put a for sale sign on it and allowed people to come look at it? And... We have not, not to, not, at least in the last four years, we have not. So take me through, if we had put a for sale sign on it and to the open market, what would have been the difference in the reactions of people who came to look at it? Would it have been any different than the folks that we have taken through? I mean, I don't know. Um, my my guess is that we would not, considering it is a, a building that the unified government owns and whether it's someone uh, proposing a renovation or or someone proposing to tear it down, I kind of look at this uh, similarly as, you know, because it is our building, we kind of have, have that standard that we can can determine what we're what we want. So we wouldn't uh, just sell it to anyone who was, you know, going to put ten dollars into it and and call it a day. Um, that would not be code compliant, I'm sure. But um, so I, I long way of saying I, I don't know. Um, it is certainly something that that we could could do and see what happens. I completely appreciate what Commissioner Stites says in terms of the critical relationship between this space and parking the tenants who would live in this renovated building and the energy and the capital that those tenants would bring to the downtown. I completely get it. I understand the additional tax value, even with the NRA, we're gonna get more from that building than we're getting today. We'll get additional residents downtown. They will probably generate sales taxes among other things that they will generate downtown. So I get it, but I am still reluctant to see this building disappear. If it were to disappear, I would say I will expect no demand that we, it doesn't look like a parking lot from Minnesota Avenue, for goodness sake, that we somehow construct a facade that hides the fact that it's just one more parking lot and makes it look better, a buffer, mm -hmm. uh, a bench, something that hides the fact that it's parking from Minnesota Avenue. Thank you. Commissioner Stites. Oh, Stites District 7. So is, is it possible that this parking lot, and I like what you said about it having the appearance of it's not just a black asphalt parking lot or concrete parking lot where people and having it shielded from the road and maybe some nice thing the plant plant or whatever however this gets uh des designed but what about the possibility of it being um gated for just those residents is that is that a thought um where the people that are paying rent you know and i i, I and i'm excited to see that we have folks that can utilize it, you know, um, people that may work down in this area can utilize those apartments. And so I just, I don't know if that's a, a thought, maybe something to think about if that could be a gated where you use your card and it's shielded and it, and it is protected for the view from, from Minnesota it looks nice. It's appealing. And you don't, you're not looking just directly at a uh, open parking lot. We, and and that's one of those things that we have had preliminary discussions with Mr. Han and his staff. We didn't want to get the cart before the horse. You don't want to spend too much time on that because we need to come to this body in the full commission. But we've already started that discussion on what that could look like. So Ms., uh, Commissioner McKiernan's comments are well received, as are yours. Mm -hmm. Commission Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Council, uh, it's already been stated you're looking at 45 spaces for the desired lot to the east. Um, do I understand correctly that this developer also owns the parking area that sits to the east of McDonald's? You see it on that screen. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. What about, what would the addition of 45 more spaces do to that lot in terms of capacity? Uh, would that be something, I mean, in other words, have we already got space there that could be utilized for uh, these new apartments and, and the other tenants that would be there? 
So from an ability to practically park what will be very nice office space, we don't have excess stalls. Mm. That's point one. Point two of two is in discussing very closely with Kevin Carnes, KDG, the developer, the expectation uh, we believe, and more importantly, they believe, is that to have the parking be sufficiently, what did I say, proximate and safe, and that member perception counts on that um, at night and what have you, it really needs to be next to it, you know, not crossing streets and all that. And without getting into the details in front of this committee right now and spending more time on it, there's already discussions anticipating that if this is moved forward on how exactly even you have secure walking from your car in the parking lot where the building is now into the residential. And again, I could start giving examples, but I don't want to do that to the chairman on committee time, but, but that's how important the proximate part is. Um, Commissioner Townsend. I understand. Well, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, see if that had been considered. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with my other colleagues who stated that for that kind of project, you do need parking, but it would be great not to have it appear as just a mm -hmm. flat, open surface. People will miss the visual of something there, even though it sounds like it's not usable right now for anything, but that is interesting. Is this lot a land bank lot? No, ma'am. It's not. It's owned by the UG, but it's not land bank. That's correct. But it is interesting that uh, maybe we've just never put a for sale sign on it. Kind of late at this point, but <laughs> that's interesting. That wasn't done. So um, I would appreciate seeing whatever aesthetics could be achieved to make it look more inviting than just the bare flat lot. I don't know if that means an arch over it um, or something is more aesthetically pleasing because that will be a hole. I think people will perceive a hole there uh, where they're used to seeing a building, even though it's not usable in its current state, apparently. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McKierney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to restate what I believe I've heard tonight is if this whole project comes to fruition, we will have a true mixed use building on the northeast corner of 8th and Minnesota. There will be commercial tenants and residential tenants in this building. Yes, sir. And a screened and a screened residential parking lot. I'm being serious. And a screened residential parking lot. I clearly, if this committee recommends this to full commission, it's approved. There needs to be adequate screening, which we'd work with. Well, Mr. another Hand thing on. that I want to remind everybody is that ultimately this committee makes a recommendation to the full commission, which then ratifies one way or the other the recommendation made by this committee. So this is this might not be the last time that this project is discussed. Thank you very much. Stites, District 7, motion to approve as submitted. McKiernan, District 2, second. We do have a motion, a second, and committee members, thank you. I do want to see if there's any comments from the public. No additional comments were received. We, we do have some people present that would like to speak. You'll have three minutes. Please state your name and place of residence, please. Uh, Greg Kendall, president of the Wyandotte Economic Development Council and resident of Kansas City, Kansas. I will admit I wasn't planning on speaking on this issue tonight, but I, I do think that having been in this role now for the last 10 plus years, and you're probably your chief real estate agent on this particular building because it is a UG building without a real estate broker on it, we have largely held the keys to this building and have shown it many, many, many times. And I, when I say many, many times, we probably have shown it at times once a week. Um, for, for a long period of time, we showed it a lot. We talked to a lot of very large, well-known companies um, throughout the metropolitan area. And very recently, we've shown it to some, some fairly well-known companies. And each and every time, here's what we basically got back as a response. I don't know what the ultimate right decision is, but here's what we've largely seen. There is zero parking for this building. So in all of the years that this building has been under the UG's ownership, and keep in mind, this is a former former EPA building. So we were not given this building when it was in good shape to begin with. The EPA left the building. 
the UG was left with a building that needed to be abated. The UG and or the EPA, long before I came along, gutted the building to some degree, but didn't do it really particularly well. It had a leak some years ago, and then the UG partially fixed that leak, but it didn't stop. So today we have a building that has zero parking identified to it. The UG didn't purchase any additional land to give it a parking lot so that we could meet those needs of those clients coming in. It doesn't technically face Minnesota in an easy way. The only really easy part to identify and, and market is on the north side of the building, which we do have an active client looking at, at that part of it. But to be honest, I don't think any of the clients we've talked to recently have the financial capacity to do the project. It has a leaking roof, well, the elevator doesn't work. We know that almost every one of these buildings downtown have major elevator issues. One minute remaining. It has structural concerns that we don't yet have resolved. I've walked that building many times. Power is not working. So we tend to take a lot of flashlights on our phones so that we can see in the basement. We hope that it hasn't rained recently because you can walk through a couple of inches of water in certain spots within the basement. It's a very interesting inside when we walk around all the dead birds and it doesn't have a lot of windows and all those windows that it does have have to be replaced. To be honest, I wish there was another option. Um, we have talked to this particular client a couple of different times about whether or not the existing parking lot to the west of that building could be improved to the safety standards they require so that we could figure out a different option to do with this building or if they would commit to a term of time in which they would construct new investment on this soon to be demolished building so that we could move forward with the project because it does drive new real estate property taxes. It does drive new uh, interest in- Your time has expired. Investment. I don't have the right answer for you, but that is the situation analysis that I have for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, have a question. I have one last statement I want to make. Commissioner Stites. So if I'm not mistaken- Microphone. It, Yes, it's on. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, it, in the presentation, it was said that ultimately the success of this project would spur additional development in the form of apartments with uh, maybe mixed use apartments, um, office space, and that would then utilize um, some above ground parking or above the surface parking would go away then, I guess is what I'm saying, right? But that is, that's our plan is for this to ultimately be successful and this not be a vacant parking lot in the future. Is that correct? Yes, and it's not a pipe dream. Just look at North Kansas City. And I'm not saying we need to be like North Kansas City, but that is a, I know people have been around that have paid attention. North Kansas City was, why wow, that could never, that will never, and just in my career, just in the last 16 plus years, guys, we just, the lawyer for, you know, and all that, for a project that what, has structured parking with beautiful apartments around it and a little, I need to go, I mean, this is not a pipe dream, it's hard, it'll take some time, it's not tomorrow, but that's the dream, that's, that's where we're heading. Any other comments, concerns, questions? Senator uh, David Haley, BPU. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure you can hear me. I'm sorry, I lost my reception for a bit. I certainly appreciate, appreciate this um, consideration for this downtown development and many of the comments that have been made, uh, notwithstanding, I respect. Um, I am going to, I, and I know which way I kind of can kind of read where it's going and, and not suggesting it shouldn't be made. I will be abstaining uh, from this particular vote uh, not because I don't think some of the merits that have been raised uh, are are, um, are good, and certainly the full commission I think will uh, will be able to consider them. Uh, I've been a long-standing supporter, though, of trying to find a means by which we maintain the integrity of some of our structures. I'm not a fan of green space or of asphalt, uh, even though the need might be clearly shown where a renovation is possible. Um, I will abstain. I'm not going to vote against this motion. Uh, obviously, those who are on the commission will have the opportunity to discuss it more fully and allay whatever concerns uh, those of us like myself in the minority might have about, about the, uh, about the uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. It's been <laughs> Commissioner Townsend. Um, thank you. Can we just have um, more of an explanation about the extent abstention? Um, so that all of us understand in what circumstances any of us could abstain, since it's so important for us as members of this body to say yes or no. I, I, I know it's quite often very hard, but you know maybe this would be a um, question for counsel as to under what circumstances a member can or can abstain from a vote. Counsel, please. If this is a Winnie Green legal department. Um, you can't abstain, but it's still going to take four votes to get it to the commission. Affirmative votes. And in essence, what an abstention vote ends up being is an affirmative vote is when it's counted. So, but you would still have to have affirmative votes. So inevitably you would count the extension, but only after you already have your four affirmative, if that makes sense. You have to have four affirmative votes to get it to go to commission. So if more than if more people abstained, you wouldn't have that affirmative votes. And I, and I think that's the underlying question I'm asking here. Under what circumstances can you abstain? Mm -hmm. Not just the count, mm -hmm. but when can you or when can you not? Mm -hmm. And and I I believe anybody could. It's just that if they if everybody does, then it goes nowhere. Okay. And I ask this question because there was way back a situation where I abstained, but because that was the relationship involved with the entity that was before the commission. I can't remember exactly what it was, but that was the situation. So that's why I'm asking under what specific circumstances, can you abstain or not? Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. I know in most cases, an abstention is usually due to a conflict of interest, whether it be personal ownership, financial uh, benefit, or a business benefit or business relationship. Uh, that's why we disclose our contacts at, at commission meetings. That uh, I know on the state side, if you abstain, uh, the body makes a determination if it's allowable or not. I don't know that we do that here at the UG, but right, I don't. I don't believe we do that. So, okay, any other? questions. Mr. Peterson, I'd just like to state that there's been a lot of nice comments, but when it comes to that building, it was we had the Landmarks Commission appear before us last Thursday, and one of the comments that stuck with me, and I remember it was Chairman uh, David Meditz that made the comment that demolition by neglect is because we have failed to board up or properly take care of the facilities that we own, and, and when, so when we talk about revitalization and rehabbing these buildings, we have done a disservice to that piece of property because we didn't take the care even when it needed care. And it just drives up the cost of a rehabilitation of that facility. I too am very concerned about the parking lot presence. I'm concerned for the safety reasons because of the parking lot, it's gonna allow the vehicles to come straight out onto Minnesota Avenue because there's not a retaining wall to stop them from coming all the way through the parking lot onto the sidewalk into the public uh, purview. So there's a header opportunity to put on the corner of the building that would reach over to a facade that could be built uh, a four foot, five foot facade on the front of the parking lot that could have an ornamental fence put on the top of that, not a barbed wire fence, not a, not a straight uh, chain link fence, but an ornamental fence that could complement the downtown area to show that that is a residential parking facility and not just a parking lot. I think the safety of the pedestrians and the safety of the traffic flow on Minnesota Avenue would be very concerning if it was just a flat parking lot. And I agree with the downtown shareholders that that open space there would not complement the downtown, even though we would have an opportunity to have the new building beside us. I don't have the answer as to the uh, cost of demolition or anything like that. My concern would be the value of that property once, once the uh, building is torn down. Now, if they wanna build a new facility, they've gotten a very good price, received a very good price on a piece of property. Now that would have to come back before us to the planning commission to determine if we even want to allow a building of such. 
but you already have a prerequisite with the Brotherhood building having a business model on the bottom and lofts and stuff on the top. So you could have your parking, your covered parking on the other uh, on the site, the 742, and then build on top of it, as you stated later on. These things all come to mind when I had a long discussion with Catherine Carter in reference to what we can do. My number one, my, my number one concern is the safety of the public dealing with a parking lot that just comes straight out onto Minnesota Avenue. I believe you, you need to talk to your partners in the process here about some sort of barrier that's an acceptable barrier that complements the fascia and the facade on Minnesota Avenue. I believe that would address some of the concerns we've heard here this evening. Uh, the, as I stated, it was mentioned a gated community. Actually, it could tie into the corner of the Brotherhood building if they wanted to on the front of Minnesota Avenue and come across with a header to the to the corner of the park proposed parking structure and tie into uh, a facade that's four or five feet tall, runs the length to the new building uh, that is to the further east of the parking lot. And you could put stucco on the front of it, whatever, but it just needs to be acceptable to our downtown community. Uh, that, that in turn would address some of the safety concerns that not only have I mentioned, but some of the facade issues that have been mentioned by uh, the committee. Uh, I can't answer if I like the building being tore down or not. I did talk with the Landmarks Commission and I have talked to the downtown shareholders and I'm pleased to see them here this evening, but there is concern about creating a gaping hole. And I think the facade and a, a maybe a gate or recognition of the facility that is being rehabbed would be uh, enough to remedy some of the concerns that we have. It, now the next question I have, if we don't take action on this this evening, what does that do to the plan? The, the, the South building, the residential building can't move forward without it. So if it's delayed, it just delays the project. And if it's not, eventually approved by the full commission that it, it, it kills the residential project. So in, in reference to the comments you've heard here this evening, you can't state, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you cannot state that they're agreeable to putting some kind of facade or retaining feature on the front part of that parking lot to remedy the concerns that have been mentioned here tonight, not only by the commissioners, but by the public. I can definitively state that, that it sounds like that's the direction. There's so much time and money in this project and I can, been around a little while here. I can read the tea leaves. It, it has to happen. Now, the fine details of working with Mr. Hand on the exact design and all that, I hope and I know you'll let us work with staff and come back before or through the planning process. But that's the color behind the answer is yes, we, we need to move forward with uh, if the votes are here tonight. We need to move forward with what's being proposed from the dais. This is a question for staff. If I may. Go ahead, please. Yes, I was going to say I did find an answer, a definitive answer to the question about an abstention in voting. Um, in section 906, um, it does say all commissioners are to vote except in cases of conflict of interest. And it specifically says, uh, um, commissioners shall discharge the responsibility of their elective offices and shall vote on all matters coming before the commission, except in those particular cases of conflict of interest approved by the presiding officer, in which case a commissioner may request permission and may be authorized to pass his or her vote Unless a commissioner votes audibly to the contrary, or unless a commissioner is granted permission by the presiding officer to pass his or her vote on a particular matter, his or her silence in voting shall be recorded as an affirmative vote. As an affirmative vote. Correct. And I believe that, that the, the council, uh, legal council, advises if we can abstain or not, if I remember correctly. The, the presiding officer does. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So who would be the presiding officer this evening? The presiding officer would be the, the head of the committee. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Commission, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Haley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Point of clarification then. So rather than abstain, um, I am a, a voting member can pass without anything. If, if it's just the, uh, what is that difference then please? Between that, an abstention okay. and a pass. It's the same thing. Yep. Okay. All right, David, did, did you get, Mr. Haley, did you get that answer? I did. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? 
Committee, uh, there's a motion and a second on the table. There's concerns. We have no commitment that the facade will be built. Uh, and But we do have an agreement with Mr. Peterson that he will work with Mr. Hand and the Planning Commission to address this issue. The main issue is, are we going to approve the demolition of 742 uh, in, this, in this discussion this evening? Uh, is, that, is that a position or a commitment this committee is ready to make uh, as a body, or would you like to bring this forward to the entire commission uh, to make the decision? Okay. Well, there could be a substitute motion. There's substitute motions always in order. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Stites. Stand by my motion and ready to go. Okay. No, nope. you're good. Mr. Cross, any comments? Commissioner Townsend. Thank you. Um, looking through here, this option contract, it, it appears, correct me if I'm wrong, that the closing date on the property is no later than two years. So does that not mean that until it's the closing date takes place that no demolition can occur? So we have time. So if we pass this, they can't demolish. And I, I need clarification from legal, but that's how I'm reading this. Mm -hmm. That if we pass it, there still can't be um, demolition until title passes. That is absolutely correct. The option agreement gives them the op the exclusive option to purchase this property after two years. Within the, they could do it within the two years if they wanted to. If they don't okay. do it within the two years then the option agreement would expire unless it's extended. But until title passes, they would not have the right to demolish. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, I ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Um, pass. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Um, this is legal again, yes. um, that it, the voting saying that he's passing it, that again has to be approved by the presiding officer. So he can't pass ahead of time without permission from the presiding officer to abstain or pass and abstain uh, saying he passes is the exact same as saying he's abstaining from voting. So he would need prior approval from a presiding officer to do that. Mr. Haley, you'll, you'll have to vote. There was no approval by the presiding officer ahead of the vote to allow the abstention. Uh, you'll okay. have to, you'll, I'm gonna have to okay. have you vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I vote no. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Haley, appreciate it. The vote is five to one. Five to one, so we will have a discussion before the full commission in reference to this issue. Thank you, committee, that was some heavy lifting, Mr. Peterson, thank you. We do hope that you take the message back from this body to the developers and let them know that we're excited about the project, but we do have some critical safety concerns in reference to the parking lot and the visuals of our downtown community. Yes, sir. Heard it loud and clear. We'll do. Thank you so very much. Committee, that takes, that takes us to item 10, the resolution criterion multifamily project IRBs. Um, that's the resolution to issue IRBs in the amount not to exceed 62 million to finance the costs of acquiring, constructing, improving, and equipping commercial multifamily facility for the benefit of Criterion. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Criterion Development Partners. Are you going to ask me to pass? Uh, Catherine Carter, you have the floor. Catherine Carter, Director of Economic Development. Uh, this is a project, uh, so we have talked about IRBs twice already. Uh, this evening, both of those were a sales tax exemption. This is the other type of IRB, so industrial revenue bond. Uh, so this has to do with uh, property tax. Um, uh, so I'm going to let Mr. Peterson give kind of a, an overview, and, and there's a lot to kind of dig in on this one. Um, but generally, uh, just to keep in mind as we're going through this, this is a multifamily uh, project. Um, proposed $62 million. Um, the way that the industrial revenue bonds would work would be, as we've seen in past uh, uh, industrial as well as multifamily projects, 
um, basically the, uh, the, the project would be um, tax exempt. However, then we come back and we put a predictive payment plan in place. Uh, so this is a payment in lieu of taxes. So while they are technically not paying property taxes, they are paying a property tax like uh, a payment every uh, every year for 10 years. Uh, and then the, the property would be put on um, the tax rules as, as normal. So we can get into all of those details uh, here in a bit, but first I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Peterson for an overview of the project. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, Kurt Peterson here on behalf of the proposed developer, which is Criterion, you had it right, Criterion Development Partners, LLC. Quick roadmap to be efficient in going through this quickly, give you a little sense of who the developer is, because that'd be your partner here, uh, a sense of the project site, a sense of the project, what we want to put on that site, and lastly, restating with the, just a bit more detail what Ms. Carter just said in terms of the, the request uh, that we ask of this committee's consideration tonight to move the project forward. So first, the developer. So the developer criterion is an approximately 20-year-old uh, multifamily real estate investment firm. They're based in Boston and in Dallas. A majority of their projects have been focused in those areas. They have approximately a billion and a half dollars of experience so far doing multifamily in those markets. Uh, they are top shelf, as I like to say, very, very high quality projects. That's all they do. And um, here I should, before going any further, should say with me from Criterion tonight are uh, uh, Kelsey Riddick and Todd Thomas, who have been working for, we're working with closely now for months on this proposed project. And then also sitting with them is Steve Allison, a face that many of you know quite well. Steve's relevance here is he's not with Criterion, uh, but Steve owns the, the land that we're going to talk about in a minute where this project would go and believes in this project enough that he will then also participate financially in the overall project with Criterion. So I'm gonna spend all of about 20 seconds trying to emphasize that point, which I think is really important. Who is this developer that's coming into town that wants to pump $60 million into this site? If you just uh, take a quick look at the screen, these are just exemplary projects they've done again in the Boston and the Dallas market. And you'll recognize you know, luxury, high-end, quality, both exterior and interior for all the projects that they do. So that's the developer, gives you a quick sense of who they are and what they're great at, what their experience is. Second is the project site. So this project site is approximately 30 acres northwest of the Speedway. It's north of state. You can see state curving around uh, there, around the northwest part of the Speedway. That's the southern boundary. The northern boundary is, you could say, the two, the Village West apartment projects there that you can see just north of uh, Delaware Parkway where the cursor is here. And this, so this 30 acre piece here, now we're gonna zoom in to that spot and you can see the shaded area. That's the 30 acres very specifically where this proposed project would go. So what do we wanna do on that piece of dirt? What is the proposed project? So it's called single family residential. That's a term of art. That doesn't actually, single family rental, I should say. That doesn't tell you much by the name, but I will tell you if you Google it, and, and now forevermore when you hear it, SFR is the acronym for single family rental. You're going to find that it is a hot commodity in the top markets and the top cities across the United States. So, so what is it? Um, in short, and I'm going to quickly tell you why it's not apartments, right? I'm going to use that, but I'm giving you the punchline afterwards. I would call it horizontal luxury apartments. And what I mean is the feel of it, right? Um, but very specifically, it's not apartments. But again, giving you a sense for what is SFR. So specifically on this site, I'm going to show a concept plan. On this site, this SFR pro product would be approximately 230 residential units. Now, these residential units would be spread across both single standalone, single family residential house, not attached to anything. That would be some of the units. And then others would be put together as a twin connected to, to one other unit, right? So you have singles and twins and a total of 230 of them. You have a mix of one and two story homes. You have a lot of different shapes because they're really believe in not sort of a monolithic homogeneous design. It looks interesting. You have all the amenities you all have seen in our handful of luxury apartment projects, right? That's why I say it's horizontal in some ways, horizontal apart luxury apartments. 
pool, clubhouse, business center, co-working space, dog park. I could continue, but you, you've seen this before. It's the, it's the top end of it in terms of amenities. Each unit would have a garage um, that's attached, part of, their, part of their home. The community design is all about having a community block. So what you're seeing on the left of the screen where I'm indicating with the cursor, State Avenue, Delaware Parkway, again, the 30 acres. If you look at these fine little boxes here, that's giving you a sense of what a little community block would look like. That's the pool and the amenities. Here's another one here. What this is not, I should say this right out of the gate for the public seeing this, these larger white boxes are not buildings. That's just because we're at the early stages. We didn't have the renderer take every one of these little blocks and draw these smaller buildings, but each one of those white blocks constitutes what you see over on the right side of the screen, which is a little community of, of residential units. For instance, here's a single that I mentioned, right? That's totally detached. Here's a twin where two units are connected. And you can see this wonderful courtyard area that they open up into. You have your garages here, right, that we talked about. So it creates a really nice sense of community. We have maintenance provided for the whole complex. So you don't take care of any of the landscaping and the green space and the amenities. It's all taken care of by Criterion and their professionals. You have one, two, and three bedroom units to give a great uh, diversity of, of type of living unit. And then if you average it all out, it's about 1,100 square feet per unit. But again, you have smaller than that and you have larger, but that gives you a sense of the average unit size. In terms of rents, because that question, oh, I don't care what project I'm doing, where I am, people would like a sense of the, the rents, right? What are people going to pay here? So insert, I'm allowed to do this, right, uh, as lawyers. Insert what I said at the other uh, uh, discussion a little while ago, the caveat, so you don't have to hear it all. But again, the market sets the rent as a point. But you certainly make plans, right, And with your pro forma. So the rents, the, the hope is the rents come in, and this is, the, this is very similar to the last discussion, Average rent, just like it gave average square footage, right, would be between $1.65 and $1.75 per square foot. Quick note, it might occur to some people in this room, because it occurred to me, because I have the privilege of doing residential projects all over the metro, that one of the hottest themes right now that we all care about and are focused on is attainable housing, right? So someone might say, Kurt, that didn't sound like attainable housing at this project to pay a buck 65 to buck 75. That's because this wouldn't be one of those projects. It's just not possible to build this level of quality with SFR like this and pull that off. That's not to say it's not important, but it's just not part of this project. There'll be other projects, you know, that I will get to bring forward and that we'll have in this, in this, uh, in unified government, but, but it's not this project just to say it right out of the gate. But also, it does provide something really important that I know is a policy goal of this unified government, which is a diversity of housing types. I've heard specific commissioners speak to this, and I want to emphasize it. This is a product that Johnson County doesn't even have one out of the ground. I have clients that are looking and trying to figure it out. This is a cutting edge, high end product that would expand what's available to both current and future Why Not County residents. One other caveat, and it has to do with community benefit, because that's something that I've heard this commission and specific commissioners talk about with a lot of projects that come forward. So even there, though there may not be an attainable component with this project, there is a community benefit aspect that's built in to the subject agreement that's in your packet that I imagine Ms. Carter may speak about in a minute. And I just wanted to put, I think it's relevant here to the attainable part. There's a community benefit associated with this project that, again, is part of the contract associated with this incentive of IRBs. So another question that always comes up, who lives here? You know, you got to be targeting, you know, some group, right? Different housing types for different types of folks and walks of life. So the target group is young professionals and empty nesters, lock and leave, that whole group. So kind of the both ends of the spectrum. And that, by the way, if that sounds reminiscent of something else, that's high-end luxury apartments. It's the, it's the same general sort of audience. And yet this provides something that many people want to get out of the high rise. They want to still feel like they're in a home. And this provides those same, again, I call it the bookends of people, right? The, the earlier in life and later in life, it provides them that home sort of atmosphere with the luxury apartment sort of feel and amenities. So what it, what it doesn't target is families. It doesn't mean a family couldn't move in, but you can get so much more, so much more yard, so much more house for your buddy if you have a family. So this, it, it could happen now and again, right? I mean, but but it's certainly not a target and it's not going to happen 
in general. So you may need a picture to end here, like I did, frankly, uh, about a year ago when I first got into SFR projects nationally. So these are just inspirational um, as they're doing their design right now. I'm just going to go through a couple of slides here. You can see them in color on the screen. Gives you a sense, again, of one and two story. Also, this is an example of common area amenities. Go interior to the common clubhouse space on this one. And another look inside a unit, just illustrative here. So with that and wrapping up, I said I would end with what the request is, of course, for this, this body tonight in terms of making a recommendation, hopefully to the full commission. As Ms. Carter introduced, the sole tool requested tonight is the use of industrial revenue bonds and both both possible benefits under the statute, one sales tax exemption for construction materials and FF and E that's over. That would help this project immensely. Um, and then secondly is predictable tax payments. And I assume Ms. Carter will probably unpack that with you. It's in your packet and in the agreement. Um, but there's really no comps. <laughs> there's no comps for a product that doesn't even exist uh, in, in our state, frankly. So it is very, very important for a project like this to have lock in uh, tax payments. So with your support for IRBs, this project is targeting an early 2023 start. It will take approximately two years to get all the way open with the last units being occupied. And um, we're really excited about it. And thank you for listening. And we'd love to answer any questions that you have an hour later. Committee, questions? Any hands up? No hands. A couple of points of clarification, if I may. The um, these are rent versus purchase. Yes, sir. Market rate. Absolutely. The um, the the road that is on it would be on the south side, I believe, of the project. State Avenue. Yeah, there there was a road that was going to be. Delaware Parkway is what I'm thinking. On of. the north side? Yeah, on the north side. It will, the road is truncated now. It won't encompass the front of this development, right? They have to expand the road. So the, I'm going to give the short answer because that's a big, you're, you're, what you can because you're the chairman. That's delving into a bigger planning issue that we haven't fully worked through as step planning staff. But the answer is we don't need that road. Our entry point would be uh, where the Delaware Parkway extends to the northeast corner of our project. But if you will, that's a bigger project to work through with a process and discussion to work through with planning. Well, do we ever build anything we're not needing for our project? You know, we talk about that. But to strictly answer your question, the road does not be, need to be extended to give us proper access. I do remember that coming forward in another discussion with development of additional uh, apartments out there. The next question, I, I see a large retention pond. I would assume that would be on the west the northwest corner of the facility, the green area. That yes, we we, we would we would have to detain on the property. We have not worked with Mr. Han on those details yet. And well, I have a pretty good idea, Chairman, of of your well thought out uh, views on that. But I I'm not cutting you off <laughs> at all. I you please, I'd like to write them down again. But I yeah, yeah. it's uh. Some of us are not fans of retention ponds. They go, they become nothing more than a water refuge for rodents and trash and weeds. And it then it becomes our responsibility to maintain them. So I would hope that if there may be an alternative to that in the development as we move forward, I do, I do hope that staff has been listening to certain commissioners that these retention ponds need to go by the wayside to the extent that we have every development, we have a retention pond and they are not, I can just state in other communities, they are a welcomed water feature in a development and not just a collection of water and vermin and everything else that comes with a pond in our community. So uh, I would hope that there would be some discussion in reference to what would, could occur in reference to capturing the water uh, from, from our community in, in design. And that's just my comments moving forward. Uh, I, am, I am not a fan, and off the full disclosure, I am not a fan of retention ponds. 
that don't add an aesthetic recreational purpose to developments. They, are, um, they become more of a burden than they do uh, a, a benefit to our community. So uh, we'll, get to, we'll get to public comment. It'll, it'll be just a moment. Uh, any other any other comments from commissioners? Any other questions, Commissioner Stites? Yeah, I 100% concur with you on the um, retention detention ponds. They 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 look terrible. They they end up not being maintained. And I think that we have the opportunity here with luxury um, housing that it no longer exists here in Wyandot County that we can turn that into a water feature, an amenity, versus it being a three foot deep collection of cattails and I won't say Casey's cups, but styrofoam cups and plastic and lids and just trash. I think there's an opportunity for us to make that look better than just, just that. I'm excited, this is in my district. Um, it's a component we we do not have right now, and I look forward to this uh, uh, moving to full commission. Thank you. Commission, any other comments or questions? Commissioner McKiernan? Thank you. Could, okay, this is what... <laughs> you, yeah, I, I can give my, my portion if... Uh, get into the financing part of Why? it, if you'd like. That would be swell. Fantastic. <laughs> Catherine Carter. Thank you very much. Catherine Carter, Director of Economic Development. Uh, so to, uh, you know, this is where the uh, the developer and, and their attorney, you know, sell you on the project. And then I, I tell you about how, uh, what they're asking and, and how the financing works. Um, so again, as we, uh, as you all know, but uh, for the edification of, of uh, those people watching, uh, the way industrial revenue bonds work for a project uh, of this nature would be that they would receive a, a 10 year, 100% uh, uh, tax exemption. However, in lieu of those taxes they would be paying, they would be receiving, uh, we would put a, a schedule uh, in place that would be a, a predictable payment schedule. So this is beneficial for both sides, especially a project like this where there aren't any real comps. And I've had uh, conversations about this project specifically with um, our appraiser, uh, Mr. Willard, uh, so that you know everything I'm saying is is accurate. Um, and uh, so the the benefit to the developer is that they can put in their pro forma for the next ten years down to the penny exactly what they are going to owe. Um, it is beneficial to the unified government. Uh, two things. One, that we can do the same is predictable. We can put into our budget. We know exactly how much uh, this project will, will be uh, paying the unified government um, and other taxing jurisdictions over the next 10 years. Um, and because of that, you know, because there is no comp, there's, you know, we went through a number of different ways that it could work. Um, but yeah, no, no predictability when it's just kind of on the tax rolls as, as normal. Um, so what we have done and what we put in place is a, a pilot schedule. And I'll show you the, the full predictable payment schedule um, here in a second. Uh, but kind of a, a kind of overview is that it starts um, at, sorry, I can't see this. There we go. Uh, it starts at a 1455 annual uh, payment per door. So that is uh, just over uh, $308,000 uh, annually. And there will be a 2% annual escalator um, to keep up with, with normal inflation. We used to do 1%. That has been increased to 2% um, with the uh, recent projects. Uh, so over the course of 10 years, the unified government will, will receive $3.4 million. Um, you know, it, this, these payments in lieu of, of taxes. Uh, additionally, there is um, the, the same LMW goals that we discussed with the last project, that 1813-8, excuse me, percentages. Uh, those are in place for this project as well. Um, there is a 4% uh, escalator, and that would be the, the penalty that is starting in year one. That is something that 
uh, Commissioner Townsend had made note of. Why would it start in year two when that we know ahead of time that they have not uh, they have not made it? Um, so we've changed that now. It's starting in year one. Um, again, I'm I'm sure Mr. Peterson will say, uh, you know, we have every anticipation that this will not be something that we have to look at because the developer will meet their goals. Um, and that's what they have told us. So that's what we are, are banking on. But we do, of course, have the penalty in place uh, if that is not the case. Um, uh, as with all industrial revenue bonds, there are an additional eight mills that are statutorily required to go to the school districts for capital outlay. Um, so that is in addition to the, the money that you're seeing here. Um, and just to give you a snapshot of what we're dealing with, this uh, this property is zoned ag. Um, so approximately $1,300 annually is what we're receiving right now uh, in taxes for this property. Um, that will change dramatically. Uh, so when we're looking at during uh, during this incentive, this IRB period, that will go up to an average. So again, you had the where it starts and, and the escalator to an average of about three hundred and forty thousand dollars annually. Uh, and then once the the uh, this uh, industrial revenue bond period is over, um, again we don't know exactly what the property tax will be um, as it has not been formally assessed yet uh, and can't be until it is is built. But we would guess somewhere in the realm of six hundred thousand dollars or or more. Um, additionally, this is more residents. Uh, we are hoping that this, uh, you know, what we have seen with other properties similar to like the North Point properties just the north of this is that these rentals get people to our community. And then what frequently happens is they fall in love with our community and want to then, you know, buy a house, put down uh, additional roots. So that is uh, certainly what we would anticipate that either as, as Mr. Peterson mentioned, you've got kind of the, the two sides uh, either it is someone who will be new to our community and then hopefully have a long a long life uh, here in, in various stages, um, or someone who is downsizing, who is currently in our community, um, or, you know, uh, I guess not, but, uh, and, and wanting a, a different uh, housing product. Um, and then additionally, there is uh, the UG uh, pilot via those BPU bills that you see, um, which will be another, you know, uh, uh, annual or monthly bill that would be uh, paid. So that's kind of a, a quick overview um, to kind of look at the exact uh, predictable payment schedule. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, that that predictability is really um, helpful for both the developer and the unified government. It gets down to the dollar uh, really exactly how much we would be collecting over the course of 10 years. Um, here are the uh, LMW goals that were mentioned. And also with every uh, industrial revenue bond project, we do a cost benefit analysis. Uh, this is a third party. This is not the unified government. This is not the, um, the developer. This is a third party that does this. Uh, and what basically what we're looking for, this is probably a 20 page document. So if you are interested, um, that will be uploaded and, and anyone can, can see the cost benefit analyses. But this is kind of the snapshot. What we're looking for is that it is kind of the threshold kind of rule of thumb is that we want to see everything is at a minimum over a 1.3. So what that means is for every $1 uh, kind of spent or, or foregone, uh, in this case, the unified government or the other taxing jurisdictions are getting at a minimum a dollar thirty back on every on every dollar. So uh, as you can see here, uh, that threshold is met in all of the different uh, taxing jurisdictions that would touch this project. Um, and with that, we'll open up to questions. Commissioner Stites, Stites District Seven, and I think this last um, slide here may have answered my question. That incorporates weird one. two school districts, right, Bonner yes. and Piper. Correct. Yeah, so uh, what I have been uh, told and because the the uh, specific uh, development plan has not been finalized yet, we don't know the exact counts, um, but what would happen and how the unified government would look at that is it would literally be however many units, you know, are 
on the side of the line versus the side of line and, and they would pay that you know, that's where those pilot payments uh, in the, you know, in the, the 10 years and then taxes after that uh, would be going to the, would be split up and going to the two different um, uh, school districts. Uh, Commissioner McKiernan. Thank you. Catherine, it's almost as if you anticipated what I was going to ask a moment ago. Funny that. Could you go way back to the very beginning uh, where we had the aerial view of the property where State Avenue is curving away down toward the left, Delaware Parkway. Ooh, ooh, uh, the, the, the previous one will work. That one will work. So it's right there. Okay, so right now, that property is part of a much larger property. This would be subdivided out of that larger property. Correct. And so, and that piece is paying its portion of the larger properties current property taxes is about $1,300. Yeah. I want to make sure we all understand Even that less. this property once developed would make several thousand times more, even in an incented state, than it's making today for the unified government. Would you say that these new dwellings, which are southwest of the other apartments on the other side of Delaware Parkway, would you say that even though these are not apartments, that they are equivalent in terms of construction, in terms of amenities, in terms of desirability? Is there a difference one way or the other? From what I have been told and uh, certainly the rents that they are, are uh, trying to get, I think this would be, and kind of how I, I did the, um, analysis for the that that predictable payment schedule i think these will actually be of a a higher quality higher grade um more i would say more akin to the legends 267 product than uh than the the um the currently two and soon to be three apartment complexes here so kind of a one one step up so it would be safe to say that these would be a nice complement yes. to those existing structures. Correct. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other comments? None were received. We'll get to the public comment. Just, just we, we, Commissioner Davis. Oh, I, I. Thought I heard there was no public comment. I'll, I'll wait. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Oh, you know their hands up. These are going to be slab homes. There will be no basements, right? No, I don't. The, the answer, Chairman, is because we're designing this fine points right now, is there may be some grade changes where you might do some basements, but mostly no, mostly slabs. Yeah. Mostly slabs. And this is not a 55 or older community. No, sir. I think you'll get a lot of folks in that age group, but no. May, may, and these are for rental units. All of them are rental units. Yes, may I ask why the developer chose to go with rental units and not a, a housing development? You're at the question, restating the question. Chairman's asking the question, why is this not a single family development where you sell houses or, or lots as compared to this? And the answer is, uh, again, like a lot of things, a much longer interesting over a sandwich, sort of like, why is this SFR product so hot in the United States? But the short answer is, if you, you know, you just think about everybody's so different in the way they think about money and what they think a home is like and all that, but you put together all these preferences and there are people that want a home they want to feel like they have a home and have community and they want to be near things like legends and all that right proximity. And yet they don't want to own their house, especially this generation. That's I know we've all read about this, rep, whatever, grandkids, cousins, brothers, whatever, but they don't want to own, they can own a house, but they don't want to. So that's some of it. Um, I could go, I, I got to watch myself and go on and on, but it, it's the psychology of that different product that is appealing to people that don't have an option like this right now, but want it. And, and I appreciate that comment. I just wanted to ensure it wasn't something that we as a local unit of government couldn't come to terms with, with a developer or anything like that in reference to the, you know, a single family housing development. We're going to incentivize, you know, we, we want people to be our neighbors and our 
family, raised our families and attend our schools, attend our events here. Um, the, uh, the only other comment uh, I would have is uh, the comment that was made by uh, Commissioner Stites in reference to the school districts, Bonner Springs and Piper, their 5% uh, taxes there. Uh, I, I don't have any other questions. So at this, at this point, if there's no other questions from the commission, Yes, Ms. Sorry. Carter. One thing I, I forgot, I, I neglected to mention um, the community benefit piece of this. So with any of these projects, um, there is what is called an origination fee. So this is a fee based upon uh, the amount of uh, the total amount of bonds. So the total investment of the, the project um, for this project, it ends up being approximately one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Um, so something that we have done um, in this uh, project for the first time, um, and I, I think is something that I'm interested in, in your, your thoughts, and if this is something you'd like us to, to keep doing or, or revert, typically this is uh, kind of something that just goes into the general fund. Um, however, what uh, we added into the performance agreement in front of you today is that, and I'll, I'll quote, such fees shall be used exclusively for local economic development activities, but shall not be used to pay any administrative costs of the city or county. So the thought here is that, you know, this would be a, a great payment if we had um, something in the future, such as a housing trust fund or um, something like that, that I know we've started having some conversations about, um, but I don't think we've, uh, or I know we have not kind of coalesced around uh, you know, a, a specific uh, way to to move forward with this. Um, we were not quite to the point. We really liked the idea of having uh, something, you know, actual uh, of, you know, money that could be provided as a community benefit, but without kind of the larger um, kind of framework, it, it wasn't, you know, we don't have something kind of readily available to, to very specifically uh, kind of earmark this to. Uh, but I do want to point out that this is, uh, you know, a, a sizable amount of money that um, at your direction could be used uh, to, you know, provide it be a gap filler for an affordable housing project coming up next. Uh, if we do move forward with a housing trust fund or something like this, this could be a nice kind of starter uh, kind of uh, fund that that gets that that moving um, so I did want to uh, uh, just point that out to you as this is something a little different from previous agreements you've seen. I believe that was what we utilized with uh, home field. Uh, it was uh, part of the home field. Development. Yeah, a similar. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No other questions or comments. Anything from the public? Oh, Com Commissioner Davis. Well, I mean, very hesitant on this particular uh, development because we hear it over and over and over again about how, um, you know, there, there's a lot of development out West, all of these great things out West, but then how are we going to take the great things that are happening on the Western side of the county and equitably ensure that um, everyone else is able to it just because right Village West is, is hot. I think uh, what uh, uh, Catherine has laid out is hopefully the framework for us to begin having those conversations on how we use the pilot payments from not just this particular development, but from others so that we can start uh, uh, gaining some ground on important issues to our community, affordable housing and access to housing. I know, for example, uh, some groups like Cross Signs and to aid have thrown out a landlord mitigation, uh, mitigation fund. Perhaps uh, the beginning of that conversation, um, I know a housing trust has also come up as well. And so I think we have to continue to be creative and get away from the, the from these developments in the general fund, because that's where it becomes impossible to ensure that development on the West flows throughout all of Wyandotte County. And so um, I'm happy to hear that. Um, I would endeavor to make an additional contribution because they do stand to make a hefty profit to definitely consider that. 
Um, but we definitely need to have more conversation on community benefit, how we're going to leverage the Western side of our city or of our city for the benefit of the rest of the county. Thank you, Chair. Welcome. Uh, any other questions? I do have, I have two different numbers on my board than what you showed up here, Catherine. You showed the present property pays only 1300 a month, but yet my records show 47,675. And then I show after property, after it comes online, you showed, uh, I believe, uh, 300 and some thousand a year. No, go on right there. 600,000 a year in property value. My paper says a million dollars a year. On my interim, on my flyer that was sitting here tonight, my PowerPoint, online down under annual benefits, it's everything else matches up, except when I get down here to the before prop before, right under annual benefits is 47,675, not the third. Okay, so which one is the accurate number? Okay, so it's it's not the ones that we have presently before us. Correct. Because that's four hundred thousand dollars difference a year in in value uh, on property. And again, this one we don't. Um, this is just a. a an educated guess, but but still a guess. Uh, in speaking with our appraiser, since we do not have anything quite like this, there there wasn't an easy comp uh, to know what this would be when it when it's on the the tax roll. So that's kind of an educated guess. Okay, thank you for that. I just wanted that point of clarification. Yeah, sorry about. Now that. we get to the. If there's no other questions from the commission, now we'll get to the public comment. Uh, do we have members of the public who wish to speak? Again, you'll have three minutes to speak, and we ask that you give your name and address uh, so we can make it a matter of record. Thank you. I'm Shirley Eichert. I live at 804 South 89th Street, Kansas City, Kansas, 66111. I was wondering, are you the same company that built the first apartments at 110th and State? This is a new company. Okay. Are you the one that's building the apartments on 94th and State? They've never worked in Wyandotte County before. This would be okay. the first. So you're not the ones that cleared the big area on 93rd and State going east. I work for the UG. I don't know. Okay. They're not. They're not no. involved in any of these. Okay. Thank you. All of you have a good evening. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with us, Ms. Eichert, on, on being able to present. Mr. Kendall, you know the, uh, the, yeah, the three-minute rule and well, yeah. the, the name. And Greg Kendall, uh, president of the Wyandotte Economic Development Council um, and, and also a resident of KCK. So I really just want to make three comments tonight, um, and I'll make more uh, as when it goes hopefully before the full commission. One, it does make a higher use of this land. Obviously, it's a far more dense use than um, we would traditionally see. And this has an, an ulterior piece of this. It increases our population. We are only growing as a county less than 1%. We're really about 0.7% annually, which is really behind most of our colleagues and our competitors in the region. We need this population growth for additional attraction and retention of the retail that we already have. So one of the things that Catherine and I often hear is what is your population growth? What are you doing to drive additional population growth in, even in this part of the county? It may seem like there's a lot of development out west, but the reality is we need far more population if we, in fact, do want more grocery stores and more retail to come into that area. Our population today does not sustain the development that we largely have there. It's the other 10 million plus folks who come visit the legends that keep that retail alive. So I just I think it's useful to keep that out there, that these are the kinds of developments we need to continue to see if we want more retail and we want to keep the retail we've got in a really tight retail market. Second, uh, there's this ongoing uh, social media thread um, on almost every development we do around multifamily that they don't pay taxes. The reality is these folks do pay taxes, is embedded in their rent. The folks who are developing this are, are fine folks, but they don't pay the ta taxes out of their own pocket. It comes out of the rental prices. And so I just want to make sure that when we see these things on social media, and as you all are out and about, please don't be caught in the middle of this trap that these folks, our citizens, folks who are going to live there and 
pay for products here in Wyandotte County are paying taxes via their rent. And the last one is, I just think it's a good reminder that this is still 335,000 net new dollars every single year for the first one year, minute and then 600,000 after it's out of the incentive period. That's a significant amount of community benefit in and of itself for you all to decide how you want to use those dollars in the general fund. And I know that they're putting extra dollars in, but I just think it's really important that we do focus on the fact that you all then have a choice to spend these additional three hundred to six hundred thousand dollars a year annually. I just want to make a finer point on that. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. Any other members of the public? Any other hands up? None are online. Okay. Seeing none, uh, this is an actionable item. Uh, I would entertain a motion to move forward if it's to be the will of the body to do so. Stites District 7, seven motion to approve estimate. McKeeran in District 2, second. We do have a motion and a second. I would ask the clerk, please call roll. Roll call. Haley? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Stites? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. The vote is six to zero. Thank you. Committee, that brings us to the end of our uh, work this evening. And I want to thank you for your patience and to the conferees. Thank you for sticking with us this evening. I will now relinquish my chair position to my colleague and good friend, Commissioner McKiernan, mm -hmm. uh, for the next bit of business once I adjourn. Yes. And I'll need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Fine. Can we do it that way? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my good friend, Beautiful. Mr. McKiernan, will now take over <laughs> and on the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee. Thank you, Commissioner Burroughs. I tell you what let's do. I'm going to ask if we can please take a five-minute break in between committees. And so we will uh, convene Neighborhood and Community Development at 825.
meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee Order, I want to announce that some committee members, staff, and public are attending remotely via Zoom, as well as those of us who are on site. All participants joining by phone or computer should mute their devices when not speaking to avoid background noise. During the meeting, we ask that everyone please make sure you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so that the public who is observing knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and his current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments on any item before the committee by email prior to the meeting. And those comments will be included in the record of this meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment on any item on the committee agenda by contacting the clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before the meeting. The public will also have an opportunity to provide brief comments on any item on the agenda, either by telephone or via Zoom from the fifth floor conference room of, either by telephone or via Zoom or from the fifth floor conference room of the municipal office building. With that, I call this meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee to order and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Roll call. Steitz? Here. Davis? Here. Townsend? Here. Burroughs? Here. McKiernan? Here. There were no revisions to this agenda after it was originally published. That takes us to approval of our standing committee minutes from the meeting of February 7th, 2022. Commissioner Burroughs, move for approval. Commissioner Mr. Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in reviewing the, the minutes, I noted that on page 24, thank you. In reviewing the minutes on page 24, I noticed that in um, comments attributed to me, there needs to be at least for the written record a correction. And at the bottom, there is second from the bottom um, line of the page, there's a phrase that says, and I quote, is opposed to fair it out. And fair is spelled F-A-R-E in, in the word it. That fair. should be to fair it as a weasel, F-A-R-R-E-T, <laughs> it out. So that is the correction that I ask to be made to the minute submitted. <laughs> As a commissioner, would you move for, I mean, would you approve those minutes with the correction as specified? Yes, I would. Thanks, commissioner. Now, I know there's a motion on the floor. Not a motion here. Oh, you, I'm sorry. Okay, you made this second. So I'm asking actually for an amendment. I'm, I'm asking. So we'll amend the initial motion to approve with the correction articulated by Commissioner Townsend. Correct. Is there a second? I'm sorry. I guess I should double back and say. Right. Yep. Do you agree to amend your original motion? That's fine. Actually, Commissioner Townsend had expressed that to me prior, and I just jumped the gun. Thank you. Need a second. Stites, second. There we go. Let's call the roll. Roll call. Stites? Aye. Davis? Aye. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Commissioner Davis, I apologize. I just saw that your hand was raised. Was there something you wanted to share with the committee? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, it could be me, but the audio sounds a little weird coming from the fifth floor of City Hall. So I don't know if anyone on communications are but not coming through. It's clear. Just be honest. Has right. that been just went, through the I'm entirety of our meeting tonight, or is that something that started recently? Uh, it, it just started uh, with, with this meeting. And I will say that as I'm listening to you coming through our sound system here in the fifth floor room, you also sound different than you did earlier tonight. And I can't put my finger on it. Okay, so it could, it could be me then. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. All right, committee, we have a fairly short uh, agenda here tonight. We have two items. On the committee agenda, one item is an action item and one item is for information only. Item number one is our action item. It is a resolution uh, to support the Mid-America Regional Council's AC Regional Climate Action Plan. And so I'm gonna turn this over to 
Gunnar Hand, who is our Director of Planning and Urban Design, to give us the presentation and set up the vote that he's asking for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gunnar Hand, Director of Planning and Urban Design. For the sake of brevity, I'll ask the Chair, do you want me to give the presentation or would you prefer a synopsis? I will leave this up to the will of the committee. If you could give us at least a high level summary of what it is that Mark has adopted that we would be then affirming. Of course. That would be great. Absolutely. And I apologize, the only commissioner on this uh, standing committee I was not able to touch base with was Commissioner Davis uh, ahead of this vote. So I do apologize uh, for seeking brevity without a full explanation. But uh, <clears throat> what we're here, what I'm here uh, before you tonight, and I'll go ahead and apologize. Uh, Matt May was trying to be here. He jumped on and had to skip out a little earlier uh, during the Economic Development Committee meeting. Uh, and then Ms. Julian Van Lu is also a part presenter for this presentation and, and this resolution. Um, she's been out of the office recently. Um, so I am here alone, but I do have others in spirit around me. Um, what we're presenting tonight is again, a resolution um, in support of the KC Regional Climate Action Plan. Over the last couple of years, the Mid-America Regional Council has been developing a uh, region-wide strategy for climate action. Um, this culminated uh, late last year in one of multiple summits they've had over the last couple of years where thousands of people were in attendance. This plan has been adopted by the Mid-America Regional Council Board and as members of that board of directors, we are effectively have adopted this plan. So the resolution is one part sim symbolic. The Mid-America Regional Council, Mark, has been asking municipalities to double back on that uh, board approval and seek a resolution from their um, respective jurisdictions, which is why we're here tonight. Secondly, staff felt it was important that as a part of that resolution, we added a small component for us to study our risk and vulnerability as it relates to, relates to climate chaos that we've been experiencing um, even this year. And we expect to and are projecting to experience more and more into our immediate future. Um, in the Kansas City region, climate chaos looks pretty uh, straightforward. It's uh, hotter days, longer days, hotter days, longer periods of drought, but annually more perception, precipitation, excuse me. Um, so we're getting longer, uh, stronger, more violent storms, uh, less often over the, uh, as, uh, over the course of time, uh, but again, extremes. So it's highly probable we're still gonna see thunderstorms, we're still gonna see uh, tornadoes, um, we're still gonna see high temp uh, snow and, and, and high temperatures, but the extremes are going to be much more so in the immediate future as we project into this. And as it relates to that, if we're drier and hotter for longer periods of time in the summer, but we're also wetter, that has a significant impact on, quite frankly, um, our stormwater management uh, infrastructure accordingly. Drier, for, we're going to have longer periods of drought, and when it rains, it's going to rain a lot harder. Uh, we might have one season. Um, <clears throat> so with all of that said, um, essentially the climate action plan, uh, KC climate action plan has one goal, which is to meet uh, net 50, excuse me, to meet net zero uh, carbon emissions uh, by 2050. That is in line with the Paris Climate Accord. And other than that, it's 160 pages of a lot of things we could or should be doing. And quite frankly, most of them we are already doing. We could arguably do, be doing them a lot better. Um, but, they, but just because we don't call them climate action or climate change doesn't mean these things aren't, aren't already in process with unified government. I call this best planning practices. This is simply a framework by which to look at them moving forward. We don't have to choose to look through these things as a climate act through through climate change lens, but it's important that we understand that collectively a strategic framework allows us to address multiple issues with single strategic initiatives or single goals. And that's really what the heart of this climate action, uh, climate uh, regional, KC regional climate action plan proposes. <clears throat> with that, we have a resolution in front of you um, in support of it. And again, we have a part of that resolution asks uh, or directs staff to develop its own local um, risk and vulnerability assessment. There is a regional assessment that's done in the regional plan, but it's very high level. Um, that uh, 
activity, that study is a part of the existing conditions report in the scope of work for the citywide master plan update whose request for proposals is currently on the street. I say that to say we're doing the work already. We would just like to uh, have direction from the commission for us to collaborate um, within the UG family. And that's the second part of this resolution. Allow us and direct us to study the resiliency of our community. With that, I'll say that this comes to you uh, with the vote of unanimous recommendation from the City Planning Commission. At the City Planning Commission hearing in May, we also had um, letters of support submitted by both the Mid-America Regional Council and Climate Action KC, which is a uh, nonprofit that was created to champion and implement the Climate Action Plan. This is our opportunity to lead this region by example at the ground floor. Staff recommends approval. Mr. Hand, thank you very much for that presentation. Does any member of the committee have comments or questions for Mr. Hand? Well, I'll use that silence as the opportunity to just make a comment, first of all, that I don't think there's any doubt about it, that the climate is changing, whether or not we have anything to do with it. I don't know, I'm not really sure, but it is changing. And I do think we need to prepare for the eventuality that the change has some impact on our lives in this city. Um, I do think that it would be good for us to examine our own operation and find out how we can be closer to, if not achieve, carbon neutral or carbon zero, uh, knowing that we are only one small piece of a much larger global community at least we can do our part on a local level to contribute to that. And you talk about a study here, and I understand that the funding for said study is already allocated, so this would not be new funding that would be needed. Is that correct? Got a hand, Director Planner Resign. That is correct. This will cost us nothing. Uh, again, it's already been approved by the MARC board, um, and it's already work that we're doing. Very good. Any other questions or comments from the committee? I see Commissioner Davis. Thank you so much, Chair. And, and I echo everything that you're saying. I think for a community like Wyandotte County, given the amount of issues that we have, especially when I think about poverty, um, environmental justice um, is, is in, in tangent with that. Um, and that our community becomes very, very vulnerable to um, not only there's the, the, the impact of irregular right activity within our weather and within the climate, but then there's the recovery efforts and making sure that throughout all departments of the unified government, we are holistically engaging this. This is not just a planning thing. This is not just for the health department. It's not just a regional thing with Mark. Um, I would love to see a collaborative effort for us to permeate this plan throughout all of the UG so that we are doing what we can to uh, prepare for um, hopefully a future that is much cleaner <laughs> and that's much safer uh, for uh, generations now and generations to come. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments or questions? If not, this is an action item and we would entertain a motion. I'm sorry, before we get to a motion, I do have a member of the public who is here in the fifth floor conference room. We'd like to offer public comment on this item. And what we'd ask you to do is just state your name, city of residence for our record, and then you'll have three minutes to make your comments here to the committee. Sounds great. Yeah, so um, I'm, ben, I'm Ben Carpenter. Um, I'm actually a resident of Casey Mo, but I'm here in my capacity as program coordinator at Groundwork NRG, who's the NBR for Northeast KCK. Um, and in my capacity with Groundwork, uh, I host community workshops um, with members of Northeast KCK, exploring connections between um, kind of you know, similar things to what Commissioner Davis was just talking about, connections between historic disinvestment, environmental injustice, and, and present day climate vulnerability. Um, and so what these workshops uh, end up breaking down, you know, we look at the old HOLs red line maps, line them up with present day maps that look at social determinants of health. And, um, and we, we 
we talk about how climate change is not just something that is uh, abstractly going to affect Wyandotte County in the future. It's, this is something that's actively um, affecting the, the lives and livelihoods of the folks who live here now. Um, you mentioned uh, the impact on antiquated sewer systems, uh, which results in flooding and packing up in the homes. Uh, we can talk about air quality, increased hospitalizations. Um, uh, we talked about increased utility burden. This is this is something that uh, residents are, are experiencing now. They have very dramatic stories detailing these, and that residents in the Northeast, in particular, due to different infrastructural disparities, are experiencing it first and, and worst. And so, this is this plan is I'm I'm very excited about it. It's something that I think um, the Casey region as a whole should be very proud of, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is, it's, I think it's a, a really good uh, guiding principle. So, thanks. Thank you much, so much, sir. We do appreciate uh, your comment. And I do see one hand that is raised in the attendees. And so, Monica, if we could uh, promote Ty Gorman is the name. And looks like we do have unmuted. So, again, if you, would state your name and city of residence for the record, and then you'll have up to three minutes to make your comments as well. Oh, it looks like we're still bringing you over. Give us just one second. We've promoted, but he needs to... Hey, can you hear me now? There we go. Okay, thank you so All much. All right, I've been promoted and unmuted. I appreciate the chance to speak. Um, I'm Ty Gorman. I live at uh, 2843 Parkwood Boulevard in Northeast KCK. Um, I just wanted to support the uh, the climate action plan and also uh, echo the and support the comments uh, of the, the previous speaker, Ben Carpenter, and also the uh, uh, committee member before who brought up how environmental justice needs to be central to how uh, we're looking at uh, adapting to climate change in the coming years through this plan. Um, so please vote in favor of this plan. I uh, would also like to mention that, uh, you know, as we're looking at developments and investment in the community that can not only bring new developers and rental properties into the area, but support the homeowners and the residents, and especially in East KCK who live here and need uh, all of the investment that uh, not only we can provide here in Wyandotte County, but the federal and state investment available for energy efficiency, um, renewable energy, clean energy that we can use uh, to invest in our homes and our neighbors, bring wealth into the community, um, and also follow this plan and adapt to climate change through uh, the UG and especially through EPU. Um, also wanted to point out that on the Missouri side, we're um, hoping to, uh, I'm hoping that they'll decide to close down the Hawthorne plant as part of this plan. Uh, coal plants are a huge part of climate change, uh, which is uh, absolutely caused by human activity and especially by burning fossil fuels and burning coal is not only one of the biggest causes of the climate change, but it is also an extremely expensive and locally polluting uh, way of producing energy. KCK has some of the highest uh, energy prices for folks who can't afford them, some of the highest energy. One minute remaining. Um, so as we look at this plan and, uh, and, and uh, do adopt it, I, I hope we can look at helping the folks here uh, as well by looking at ways to close down the Nearman plant, invest in folks' homes to lower energy use and energy burden and investing clean energy in our community. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Please support the plan. Thank you so much for those comments. Anyone else who wants to give public comment in for this item? I'll ask the clerk if we received any written comments regarding this item. No comments were received. All right. With, those, with that presentation, I do want to point out at the moment that in the meeting agenda, so in the materials that are available online, there is Mr. Han's entire presentation 
which does go into much more detail than he went into here tonight. So anyone who wishes to dive deeper into this and see how this plan might lead to deliberate positive actions on our part can certainly find that information in tonight's agenda. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, thank you so much. Committee, this is an action item. Is there a motion? Townsend, District 1, move to approve. Commissioner Burroughs, at large, District 2, second. Thank you. There's been a motion and a second. I do see now that we have had another hand raised in the attendees. Mr. Thomas Gordon has raised his hand, and so we'll have to offer him the opportunity to speak. It looks like, Mr. Gordon, we have unmuted you, and so if you are unmuted locally, if you'd state your name, city of residence for the record, you'll have up to three minutes to address the committee. Looks like you're muted again, Mr. Gordon, if you would unmute. Okay, can you hear me? There we go, thanks, sir. Okay, uh, I just need to ask a question. Sir, if would you want to just, just, just for our record, sir, you would just state your name and your city okay, of residence I'm sorry. for the record. Okay, my name is Thomas Gordon. Uh, my address is 2521 North 7th Street, Kansas City, Kansas 66101. And thank you for allowing me to speak. I just need to ask a question. I, I was on another civic Zoom meeting, but did was anything addressed about the uh, sewer uh, separation mentioned in this particular action? the separation of sewer, when we were talking about what Mr. Carpenter was speaking about, some of the concerns that we were talking about the environment, about that the Northeast area has a combined sewer uh, system. Was anything talked about in this particular plan addressing that at all? Okay, so thank you, Mr. Gordon. Your, your comment is that if I can infer from what you just said, you believe that a an addressing of the combined sewer system should be a component of the study and the plan that we are about to undertake. Well, I'm asking if it was, and if it wasn't, yes, I think it should be something that should be further uh, investigated because based off of the information that has been shared with me by uh, Burns and McDonald, I believe it was, was that they were going to implement a a uh, sewer water treatment facility right near Big 11 Lake, which brings a major concern to me and other uh, residents that I've spoken to in this community. Thank you, sir. These times are generally for public comment, just more of a one-way rather than a two-way dialogue or question and answer period. And so we have heard you state your concerns about combined sewer separation, and we've heard your concerns about future plans for sewage treatment or water treatment plants that might be constructed in the Kansas City, Kansas area. And we will ask Mr. Hand to incorporate those into his study and plan. Thank you. You are very welcome. I don't see any other hands raised. There's a motion and a second to approve as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call. Stites? Aye. Davis? Commissioner Davis? Aye. Thank you. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. The vote is five to zero. Mr. Hand, thank you so very much, not only for the work that you have already done, but the work that you are going to continue to do on this particular project. That takes us to item number two on the committee agenda which is an information only item, but very interesting. We're gonna have Ashley Hand now is gonna give us a presentation on a proposed regional approach to micro mobility management. The three M's that I'm sure you will tell us what that means. It couldn't get any more exciting than this. I have to say, and I appreciate your patience waiting till we get to this pivotal moment of the evening. 
Good, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Hand. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications. And while it may seem a little funny that this is coming from your Director of Strategic Communications, the reason is twofold. One is I appreciate how intensely important it is to have a very holistic approach to data management as an organization. Data is one of our most kind of prolific and only increasingly accessible uh, asset and resource that we have to, uh, to use in our planning and to think about how we provide services to our community. And then the second part of it does come from the fact that I do come out of the mobility space and civic innovation space, working with organizations across the country on how to adapt in an era of rapid technological innovation. And when we think about what's happening in this space, micromobility, let's see if I can figure out how to use, there we go, is pretty straightforward. Um, it has been a series of for-profit companies that have, and some nonprofit companies that have emerged providing for, uh, private shared mobility services, whether they're e-bikes or scooters, and in some rare cases, even a pogo stick in the city of San Francisco, that you can rent for a short amount of time, either through a membership or through uh, a pay-as-you-go approach. It requires uh, a smartphone in most cases, although there are some really excellent workarounds for the unbanked populations and communities across the country, including within our own. Currently, the way that our mobility works in terms of the private mobility providers that are providing shared space, uh, uh, services. In this case, it is mostly scooters in the city of Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, the e-bikes are run by the nonprofit Bike Walk KC in partnership with KCATA. So they are a not-for-profit operation. But the reality is, is this market is increasingly growing. And as a relatively small community, we don't have a lot of leverage at the bargaining table. And so what happened is as of last April, our uh, one-year contract with BIRD, which is the mobility uh, provider that we currently work with in KCK, uh, expired, just sunset. And so we're kind of at a very interesting turning point. Meanwhile, our partners in cities across the region are also looking at how they manage micromobility. You may have heard and probably have seen, they can often cause um, impediments in the right of way, whether you're uh, a pedestrian or riding transit, they are often um, dumped at transit stops or crowding sidewalks and they become a very difficult thing for us to manage and enforce. So currently we have to negotiate every single contract with each of those individual providers. We then have to provide the oversight and then we have to make take steps in terms of enforcement. What we're proposing is looking at a more regional approach, which there we go, would essentially uh, establish the Mid-America Regional Council, which houses quite a bit of transportation data for us already. We already collect a lot of congestion and traffic movement data, as well as safety data. They uh, take a very comprehensive inventory of our crash data across the region to help us understand where our infrastructure is safe and where it's not. I'm gonna blame Gunner for this microphone. Um, <laughs> And so what we're proposing is that in lieu of us as an organization going out and negotiating with every single data uh, mobility service provider, that we work with the Mid-America Regional Council, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and the city of North Kansas City, who are the first three to kind of come together in this discussion, to create a regional clearinghouse where all of that data from those third-party providers could then go to the Mid-America Regional Council. And then it would allow us the ability to better manage that because we don't have to procure a software or like the storage capabilities for all of that data, but it is centrally housed. The Mid-America Regional Council, as part of these conversations, is looking at a multi-jurisdiction um, open-ended RFP to pursue finding the right type of vendor that could provide these services to the region. And then we, as a relatively small community, would only pay for the services that we could actually afford and the services that we would use to manage mobility data. And what that allows us to do is to take a more holistic approach of what's happening, how people are moving, the trips that they're taking, and perhaps even better understand the barriers uh, and certainly across geography. And the ultimate goal, if I can get this one last time, so 
the big slide, and now I can't figure out which way to point it. Oh, there we go. Is that this would this mobility clearinghouse would eventually integrate other mobility service data. So we'd start with scooters. It would be a natural extension, and we've already had a preliminary conversations with KC Streetcar and KCATO about integrating their e-bikes, their bus, and streetcar data into this regional clearinghouse. And then we start to have the ability to layer on multiple benefits to us as a community, including a regional standard around data, a regional standard around enforcement and regulations, and hopefully uh, with time that would give us more position to negotiate the kind of contract terms with these mobility providers that best serves our community and takes away some of our size as a factor um, in terms of the potential limitation because we could then be working across the region and thinking holistically about mobility as a service. And I'll pause there. Guessing the pause is to allow any of us who would like to. I, I can see your face, Commissioner. I, 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 can, I know there's something going there. <laughs> there definitely is. But I'll see if any other members of the committee have comments or questions for Ms. Hand. Okay, so I'll jump in. So we gather all these data, and what is it? What does it get for us that we have all these data? Does it get, get us a better contract with Bird that doesn't expire while we're using it? Does it get us a streetcar extension west of state line? What, what do these data get us? Well, I'm glad it was not a gondola. That was the part of that um, question. Uh, but however, I will say that there's several benefits in the near term. One is understanding mobility behavior, where people are traveling, how they're taking trips, what they're willing to pay, what type of kind of movement you're generally seeing. That has been extremely important for communities as we kind of get more complex, those questions about how many parking spots, for example, should an, a de development be required to have. Having better understanding of particularly urban movement is really important to understanding how we can start to see some of those behavior changes. Because we do know that across the population, fewer people um, of driving age are getting their license. There are fewer cars being produced than ever before with peak car being in 2017. So we know that the trend is away from car ownership and that is a huge impediment to the cost of living because that's often the second highest household expense. So I think in the near term, we see some benefits with our plan we see the potential to better manage these services. And when you offer what's considered mobility choice, more than one mode, that you can right size the vehicle based on the trip that you're taking. So what I would ride to go to the grocery store by myself would be very different than what I would do when I bring the three children with me. So knowing that you can right size your trip by plugging into a network that offers a bus, offers a bike, offers a scooter, that starts to open up a lot of flexibility. Flexibility. And then finally, from an analytics perspective, there's a ton of data mining that we could do. Plus, a lot of companies are building apps on top of these, this, these data sets that would allow you as a consumer to better access mobility because we've standardized and created an interoperable system that works across all jurisdictions in the metro. Any other comments or questions from the committee? So this is something that will be evolving moving forward. Yes. Will there be a need to bring this back to commission for um, either funding or approval? Well, besides being purely fascinated by the topic, I think um, there certainly are opportunities. There is an RFP that we are tentatively kind of been part of that process of creating that that would go out. And then in September, they would try to make a decision about what to do and then we would decide as an organization whether or not we want to participate at this point or whether or not we have enough capacity to actually join in but wanting to be there at the early start so that we have an opportunity to kind of at least weigh in on some of the standards and requirements so that if we do elect to participate. So I would imagine in the future, there may be opportunities. There are also opportunities around policy setting as this shift in mobility behavior has created considerable changes in the way that we expect and choose to move around. And I think there's things that we could certainly look, like, look at as an organization from a policy perspective that the commission would absolutely wanna weigh in on. Very interesting. Um, one more time, I'll ask if there's comments or questions. Otherwise, thank you for bringing this forward. 
certainly as we look at unifying the region and making it easier to get from place to place, not only within our city, but within our region. And as we open up the possibilities of all of these other modes of transportation, I think we really have a, a very uh, neat opportunity to make people more mobile within their local or the broader community. So I look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you so much. That takes us through our committee agenda and takes us into our land bank agenda. And as we get started on this particular agenda, as Mr. Knapp is making his way up to the table, I'll just tell the committee that when we reviewed the agenda for this meeting, the mayor asked that we take the majority of items that were up for consideration at this meeting and hold them for a period of at least a month as commission. And, and this is something that we have teased in the past, but Commissioner Davis agreed to be the commission lead on a group that is composed of commissioners and UG staff and community partners of all shapes and sizes to go back and review the policies and procedures that are uh, un the undergirding of our land bank operation. And so as we get that process running and as Commissioner Davis recruits his team, then the mayor asked that at least for this month, we put the majority of the applications that were going to come before us on hold. And at this point, I'll recognize Commissioner Davis. Thank you so much, Chair. Yeah, I just want to share a little bit of uh, the process. So currently right now, uh, the focus has been to recruit commissioners to be a part of this process. And the reason why, um, just for the community is aware as to why commissioners are being recruited to be a part of this process is because if we're going to make any uh, changes to our land bank policy, we, the commission, right, are going to have to vote in favor of it. And so um, what I did not want to do is put the onus on community members or other community stakeholders that are ultimately not the final decision makers, have them do all of that work. And then there'll still be some sort of a gap on preferences when it comes to policy. And so um, the current uh, uh, process is commissioners have been recruited. Uh, we're going to meet and just get kind of caught up so we're all on the same page. From there, we're going to meet with some key community stakeholders and then also engage um, kind of wider staff in the mayor's office. Um, from there, we will have community uh, listening sessions on land bank policy. Um, no particular information is available right now because we're still in our infant stages, but I do want to make the community aware that there will be news and there will be opportunities to uh, give your perspective and your opinion on how we should um, make some changes to the land bank. Um, there already has been some uh, great success with the land bank, but there are some things that we can do better. And so those things will be explored uh, this summer and in the fall. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. At this point, I'll turn the floor over to Judd Knapp, our land bank manager. He has two yard extensions for us to consider. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, so the first one is at 4967 Oak Avenue. They currently own 3149 North 51st Street. Uh, this, uh, the 4967 North Oak Avenue is an unbuildable lot due to that it's landlocked and there's no sewer connection and it is under one acre. Uh, the second yard extension is for 1522 South 8th Street. Uh, the applicant currently owns 1520 South 8th Street. Uh, this lot is unbuildable. Uh, it is on a very steep hill and it's 300 feet away from the nearest sewer. Uh, but this Application does not really follow our rules since 1520 South 8th Street is a rental, uh, but they said that the hillside is pushing against the foundation of their home and they need this land bank lot to move dirt away from the, take the pressure off the foundation to save the home. So that's why I included it in this presentation. So Commissioner, that concludes my items for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. Does any member of the committee have comments or questions? Commissioner Burroughs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Burroughs, at large district two. Move for approval. Fine, second. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second to approve these two transfers as submitted. Before we get to a vote, I'll ask you if there's 
Anyone in attendance tonight would like to make public comment on either of these applications? I see no hands. I'll ask the clerk if we received any communication regarding these applications. No communication was received. Not. There's been a motion and a second to approve these yard extensions as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call. Stites? Aye. Davis? Said I aye. <laughs> Was that an aye, Commissioner Davis? Aye. Sorry. Thank you. Townsend? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. The vote is five to zero. Thank you. That takes us through the land bank agenda. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. There's been a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for your work.